May 2nd, 2023 city council meeting. We are going to get started. A couple council members still filtering in, but we have pretty packed agenda today, so we don't want to get behind. Um, welcome to our meeting. These are public meetings and you, the public, are welcome to join in person or by watching from the council's agenda page on Zoom, Facebook, SLC TV, or YouTube. Um, we hope you'll continue to join in whatever manner you feel most comfortable. Right now we're in a work session because, and during, because of that there is no public comment. But tonight at 7 p.m. we will have a formal meeting and you're welcome to share your comments with us there. We of course always welcome your feedback anytime by mail to P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84115-54476, by email to council.comments at slcgov.com or via our 24-hour phone comment line 801-535-7654. Um, anything that we receive that is related to items on our agenda are posted to our website, slccouncil.com, as well as shared with all council members. And that will bring us to our first agenda item, which is our usual updates from the administration. We have uh, community outreach, an update on homelessness, and I think we will have an update from the Police Civilian Review Board as well as um, on flooding today. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. We just have a technical issue right now. Okay. Just waiting for confirmation if I can get, if anybody's hearing the audio now. Do I need to start over? <laughs> All right, if I could get confirmation from Scott, Thais, or Didi, if you can hear us. I've adjusted the Zoom audio setting. Usually it shows up there. I got you. All right, checking again. Do I need to talk? Oh, to just a confirmation if I could get from Thais and Didi, if you could, or if anybody could unmute Scott and just let us know. I can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. So are we good to proceed? Okay. There were just announcements and now we're on our updates. Excellent. Go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Katie Reiser. I'm the special projects and volunteer manager with the mayor's community outreach team. And I'm happy to be here and provide the community engagement updates today. First off, want to remind everyone uh, our webpage for residents to go and engage with the city, um, located at slc.gov feedback. Next slide, please. I think we just need one second while we get the slides up. All right, next slide, Scott. We have a lot of updates for you this week, and to start things off, I want to share two programs that I'm personally involved with, Love Your Block and SLC Core. Uh, Westside residents have one more week to apply for a Love Your Block mini grant. Applications will close May 10th. It's been a busy month for Love Your Block as they help host the Earth Day River cleanup, conducted a service day of service at Sherwood Park with the Salt Lake Bees and completed the Glendale Community Learning Center Garden Improvement Project. A big thanks to all the volunteers, project leaders and partners, in particular Home Depot who brought these ideas to reality. Next week, Love Your Block will be welcoming staff from the Bloomberg Center for Public Innovation at John Hopkins University for a site visit here in Salt Lake City. Also want to provide an enormous thank you to all the Salt Lakers who showed up for one another this past, past month. On April 15th, over 500 volunteers took part in emergency sandbagging efforts, during which over 30,000 sandbags were filled. The following weekend, another 1,200 volunteers took part in the Earth Day River cleanup. During this, trees were planted, artwork installed, and thousands of pounds of trash and debris was removed from the river corridor. This, pro this effort was made possible through the support of dozens of partners and organizations, so big thank you to everyone who showed up and, and supported that. Next slide, please. There are updates for two of our citywide plans. The citywide transportation plan, previously known as the transportation master plan, is in draft form and circulating internally. And the housing SLC plan was recommended for adoption by the Planning Commission on April 26th. 
The environmental plan to remediate the concerns on the other side village land has been submitted by the sustainability team to the, Depart to the Division of Environmental Quality last week, and they expect to get an update from them in two or three weeks. Next slide. Two notable planning efforts have been recommended by the Planning Commission for adoption and are headed to the Council. They are the Affordable Housing Incentives and the Sugar House drive through Text Amendments. The reorganization of the local historic district chapter, which does some clarifying of the process to historic district designations, as well as some chapter changes, is going to be at the Historic Landmark Commission on May 4th and the, and the Planning Commission for a public hearing in June. Two en engagements have begun. The ballpark station area zoning map amendments has started its 45-day engagement period, and the adaptive reuse ordinance update, which should promote more reuse of existing buildings and discourage demolition, has begun some initial scoping engagement and should start its 45-day engagement soon. Next slide. Some bus stop improvements with construction beginning on 400 South. And new pads are complete for 600 North and 100 North bus stops. Those are just waiting on UTA to complete amenities like shelters, benches, trash cans. In 2025, as you know, 2100 South is going to be reconstructed from 700 East to 1300 East. And the public announcement of the final design should be available in the middle of May. This project has its own website at 2100SLC.org. The first phase of the Capitol Hill calming project is out for bid and should be back on May 10th. The second phase will include various intersections, including the quick build intersection at 600 North and 200 West that was built in 2021. The second phase will be constructed in 2024. I think we lost the slides. Scott, are you still there? I can pull them up, Mr. Chair. Give me one second. Thank you. We're back. Go yeah, ahead. we're on the transfer, transportation slide, slide six. One more. There we go. The Kensington Neighborhood Byway, a project to bring more safe routes for multi-modes to District 5 and 6, has finalized their initial engagement and study reports. Concept plans should be available for public review in coming weeks. The 1000 West intersection and traffic calming project has rebooted and started with some preliminary engineering and stakeholder coordination happening now. The 600 and 700 North reconstruction project team has gotten a consultant design team under contract and is initiating a nine-month process to refine the vision for the corridor, which will involve community and stakeholder engagement. Finally, the Livable Streets program aims to implement neighborhood traffic calming in Salt Lake City at a citywide scale. The goal is to improve the overall safety, livability, and attractiveness of neighborhood streets. This is the first traffic calming program in the city since 2003. Small public meetings have started and a second round will cast a wider net and encourage more people to participate and provide feedback around the needs of the community in regards to traffic calming. A survey is also live on the website in English and Spanish. Next slide. Finally, I want to remind folks of our outreach team's remaining office hours for the month of May. We hope folks will come by and chat with any of our liaisons at the following locations. That's it. Thank you. Uh, what do we have next? Andrew? Hi, yes, Mr. Chair. Hi, Andrew. Afternoon. Uh, as you can see, uh, we've had some changes in the occupancy of the resource centers. Um, the resource centers themselves, the 700 beds for the adults, is running at 97% capacity, give or take. Um, 
the changes in the overflow, you can see the overall has been down to about 89%, mostly because we've been, they've been drawing down the number of beds, uh, and they did close the winter overflow uh, as of Monday morning this week. So uh, a number of folks um, had to exit those facilities uh, for the season. You can see the rapid intervention and uh, encampment impact mitigation work that will be going on. Uh, a lot of work along the river, obviously, in Folsom Corridor, and then reoccurring locations across uh, city parks and various places in the city as well. And we have a regular schedule that we've shared with you all. The resource fair you can see on the 12th at Library Square in the morning. And then there's also a, a new thing, the block party at Topher Park, which is just uh, east of the Geraldine Women's Resource Center. And uh, in a joint work with the Central City Community Council, the HART team is helping them do that on the 13th, I believe. Yeah. And then Kayak Court will be on the 19th. Uh, however, due to the uh, elevated uh, levels of the Jordan River, they're not going to be on the river necessarily. They'll find an alternative way to do the outreach along the banks and other places. Uh, are there any questions, uh, Mr. Chair, about any of that? Council members, Council Member Valdemar. Uh, an announcement. I think I, I said something last week. Uh, for the resource fair and the tougher block party. So District 4 usually has a table in there um, where we talk to people, but what we started to do is to get some clean clothes. So we took in donations, we sort it out, and then we give it out to people experiencing homelessness right then, right there. So if anybody has extra clothes please and clean clothes, please bring them over to the third floor. If you guys want to volunteer, you can come over. I know I have volunteering um, groups already signed up for it, but it's always nice to be around and chat with everyone up there and ask the questions what's happening in their lives. Thanks. Thank you, council member. Very helpful. Very, very helpful. Uh, next slide, please, is the- Mr. Chair. Oh. Yes, council member Fowler. Sorry, I just wanted to say that um, for kayak court, we will usually be on bikes, which is also very great. And we get to help our fellow people with bike issues sometimes. So just to FYI. Great. This slide uh, is about the uh, an update on the homelessness, the homeless housing grant, um, which the council approved several months ago for a um, a number of projects who applied. And this is a quick update since some changes have, have occurred since uh, you approved that grant. First one is the Point at Fair Park, which is at the uh, western end of North Temple. It is opening this week. Um, so on schedule, 94 units, um, really targeted towards uh, seniors and veterans uh, with some uh, basic income. And uh, they'll probably have some event as well that we haven't yet um, heard about the date on. The second one is Ville 1659, which is a former Ramada property on North Temple. Um, that was a little more complex because of the ground lease and some other issues with it. So they have been slightly delayed. They are still moving forward with a new timeline, and I believe we've had information sent to the council about that. Uh, but that's also posted to our website so the public can follow along that if they're expecting it immediately, there's going to be some delay there. The third one was the Medically Vulnerable uh, Project, which was outside of Salt Lake City in another city. Um, They've also run into some complications about the siting, but they're still moving forward on that. Um, they are working with the city um, for that project, and they anticipate that probably mid-summer uh, they'll be able to open that up. Um, but again, these are a bit more complex than the first one in some ways as far as the land acquisition and working with other jurisdictions. Um, so we did anticipate that there were some risks that would be delayed, but uh, delay is better than not doing them, and they're still on track to open up the units we need this year. Thanks, That's Andrew. All, Mr. Chair. Council members, any other questions? Was, it, was that your last slide, Andrew? That is. Great. And I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, a lot of those, were these the ones that were funded by, were these, did we fund these through ARPA or through? Through the grant. Through the grant. Great. Yeah, through the grant, and they also had uh, state so funding as well. Million for yeah. the six million that we allocated. For Each of these report. three got two million apiece. Right. Out about six million. Well, better late than never, I guess. <laughs> Glad that they're still going forward. Are all of these within a time frame, or do we need to do anything? We're bringing that forward because the original contract was based on May 1st for opening up a majority of the units. Um, there were contingencies in the contracts in case there are issues that came up that they could apply for extensions on them. Uh, but we'll have more discussions with you all about that as well. Okay, great. 
Um, let's see, who's after you, Andrew? Rachel? And is it Tanya? Hello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for giving us an opportunity to introduce Tanya Richardson, the Civilian Review Board Investigator to the City Council. I think this is Tanya's first time in front of you. Um, as you probably remember, Rick Rasmussen, who was with the city for decades, I believe, um, <laughs> retired last year. So Tanya's been with us for about a year, mm -hmm. and I'll let her introduce herself more thoroughly. But um, also, I think, as you know, the Civilian Review Board is housed in HR in order to keep it separate from the police department. And Tanya can answer questions about um, what the Civilian Review Board does, uh, how they go about assessing investigations, and any other questions you have about the, the board as it currently sits. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, Tanya. Thanks for being with us today. No problem. I was going to use yours. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then the slides are up there, and then you can just... You have to tell them to advance the slides because your computer okay. doesn't control that. Yeah, thanks you reminded me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I haven't met you before. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to speak with you all and finally meet you. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of my history since I hadn't met you formally. I've been an investigator for 15 years. I started out with um, being a peace officer in the state of California for 10 years. The last three years I was promoted to the investigations unit and that's when I started my experience with investigating. Uh, from there I moved to Georgia and I was an investigator in Georgia with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for the medical examiner's office. Then my husband and I actually moved here. <laughs> I was, well, I was actually in Georgia, I was also with the Atlanta Citizen Review Board, and that's where I got my experience doing the civilian complaints for the police process review. And now we're here. I've been here about a year. I'm liking it. It's nice. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I love Utah so far. <laughs> All right. I'll go ahead Good and get started on here. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll be here as long as you'll have me. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll just go ahead and give you guys the overview of the Police Civilian Review Board for the people who aren't unaware. The Police Civilian Review Board is a volunteer board that provides independent civilian oversight on excessive use of force and other complaints regarding the Salt Lake City Police Department. Next slide. The board accepts all investigations, all cases involving police use of force, whether the victims file a complaint or not. The board automatically accepts allegations of discrimination, profiling, harassment, abuse of power, or any conduct that is egregious in nature. Next slide. We have the uh, potential for a 21-member board right now that was expanded in 2014. Um, in 2020, it was expanded to the 21 members. Um, each council district has three positions available within the board. Their terms are three years, but under city code, a board member whose term has expired may continue to serve until a replacement board member is appointed. Next slide. Nomination by the mayor and final appointment by the city council is one of the requisites. Extensive background check to ensure that members may have access to Bureau of Criminal Investigations and other sensitive information is one. The ride-alongs with an officer of the Salt Lake City PD is each in each of the city's three precincts. Training by Salt Lake City PD Internal Affairs is required. Attendance at the Citizens Academy and meetings with community groups. Those are the board member requirements to attend. Next slide. The planned improvements we have are as follows. We have background checks that are met commensurate with the board's work, which will streamline the onboarding process and reduce intimidation. will allow onboarding requirements to be completed concurrently or after the board member is seated on the board. Improve public access to the PCRB reports by updating the PCRB website as soon as a report is ready to be publicly released. Updates to the PCRB website that reflect the onboarding process timeline and both board members and applicant status with the board. Next slide. And if anyone is interested in applying for the board, you can apply at the city website, the www.slc.gov slash boards. Next slide. And that is it. Okay. And I'm 
available for any questions you guys might have. I had a quick question. Um, you mentioned that the board will review cases whether or not a complaint was filed. What's an example of a way the, a case would reach the board if not by a complaint by the victim or the alleged victim? It, a lot of times we get internal reviews within the police department. Once it's presented to internal affairs, they share their information with me and the investigation is picked up by my office then. Is there a peer, like an anonymous peer system where people can kind of provide tips to the CRB that, uh, that may not come from, that, that would be anonymized? Or? They, they can, but typically it's not anonymous. It can be, but typically when people call and complain, they want you to know who they are and exactly what their complaint is about. I see. Mm -hmm. Council members, any other questions? Mr. Chair. <clears throat> So uh, obviously th this is a very good update. Thank you for being here. Um, th obviously we have read uh, an article related to this board uh, and I've been uh, communicating with this uh, neighbor of mine that was, uh, was waiting for this whole process to, to go through. Okay. And I see in the previous slide on the uh, plan improvements uh, that, you, that you guys mentioned some streamlining. So there is not uh, that bottleneck, uh, if you wish, uh, on getting those applicants um, join the board. Um, my question, I guess it would be more of a technical question, not necessarily so much about, um, so much about the administration, but um, how do we, um, how do we make sure that these people that, uh, that got apl applied and went through the process don't, um, and they've been waiting for six months or so, mm -hmm. uh, can get, get that term back uh, or, or some sort of a process or, you know, that term, wasted term, if you wish, where they were waiting for this whole long process. Um, it, it, it's not... I mean, let me rephrase. Obviously, today I need more coffee, but one of the things I'm trying to say is uh, this volunteer wanted to join this board, went through the process, the administration saw it through, or, or they're helping this, this member go through. This person wants to contribute, right? And he's been sitting, waiting for, for months and months. So how do we make sure that this doesn't happen first in the future? I think the stream, that's how the streamlining that you guys mentioned uh, is, is there. So we, that's great. But how do we fix this specific case? How do we help this individual uh, contribute and be part of the board uh, and give those six months back, if you wish? And I don't know if that's in, it's something that we need to change an ordinance or, or there's some administrative way of solving this problem. Right now, it appears to be an ordinance change, which is something we've been speaking about for months. Um, Pretty much since I got here, we realized there were some changes that could be made within the onboarding process to become one of the PCRB board members, and we have been working on that, and it's something that we're still continuing to work on. The people who came in this last group were actually, they had applied, but the process did take a little while. That's why we're focusing on the streamlining of how to make that process quicker. But to, from the start date, I believe is what you're referring to, um, when they're actually appointed to when all the training's completed and then they actually start serving as board members and voting on cases, that's something we do need to condense. Going back in time to backdate that is something that would have to be done through the ordinance change in the council. Two parts, if I may. Sure. Um, the, so, so the term starting dates, uh, we can work with the city attorney's office on and get the council a document pretty quickly, I think, to get that issue resolved. And then I'm not clear on whether the, um, the streamlining that you have recommended is going to take any ordinance change or if that can all be done administratively. We believe it's going to be an ordinance change simply because it will change the stated guidelines for their training that is in the ordinance. Okay. And that's, that's, like I said, that's something we've also been speaking about for quite a while. Okay. So if if there is a way to do it administratively, I, I have the sen sense that the council wants you to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you need it done through ordinance, we can work with you. Um, and the city attorney's office to do that quickly. Oh, thank you very much. They'll definitely be happy about that. We've been meeting monthly to discuss that so that we can 
get this done quicker and get the dates appropriate for when they actually start and are appointed. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Um, uh, okay, so Council, <laughs> Councilman Wharton and then Dugan. I saw both hands, go ahead. I swear that this was part of what we addressed when we made changes to the ordinance back in 2020. Um, and, um, but since that did seem like a long time ago and, um, and uh, many iterations of different things ago, um, I may, maybe I'm misremembering, but I, I remember that this was a problem back then, the background check backlog, the ride along stuff. And am I just misremembering that, that this was one of the things that we addressed and maybe it just wasn't enough or I'm looking at the rememberer in chief? Um, I'm not sure. It's possible that we accidentally made it worse. I don't know. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Occasionally we think we're doing something no. really good and we recommend it to you and then it's like, oops. So we'll find out. Rachel, did you have a response to that? Uh, sure, just to add on to that, um, I think we can, we can definitely revisit any of the legislative intent that might not have gotten uh, fully implemented when we did update the ordinance and expanded the membership in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there are some administrative things that we can do, and I think we can start doing those immediately in terms of the level of background check. Um, and also I think some of the concurrent processes that we can do and if there are other things that would be outside of that scope to you know run those concurrent processes administratively we'll definitely be back as, as Tanya said we've been meeting with HR attorney's office yeah. mayor's office etc to try to dial in what we need to do to make this process easier faster less invasive thank you I, I mean I really I don't want to add to the pressure but I had to read the article twice because I was like, no, no, we, no, we made this better. We, 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 <laughs> we, I, we, no, this can't be right. And, and so if it is something that we did change that made it worse, uh, and that's absolutely not, was not the intent. Um, I'm saying this to the public, um, you know, we've known that this is a problem for a while, but I genuinely thought that we had made a lot of improvements, and so I was really surprised to to find this information out. And um, it's really very critically important to me that we do, you know, any all of the changes that we can as fast as we can, because, um, yeah, for all the reasons that that we've already got covered. But thank you. I would also just add, I apologize, but I would just add too that there, there's a great deal of, you know, additional information that you probably didn't read in the media report um, regarding how this board functions, the transparency around the board. Um, yes. The, no. the website is um, updated at this moment and cases are uploaded as quickly as possible and apologize for the lag over no, the last few months on that too. I appreciate that and I, I, I should say that all of the comments that I just said are just related to the onboarding and the review um, turnaround time. Like I still think that there are many, many changes that we made in the area of policing and oversight that I think have been hugely helpful. So I don't mean this to be a broad criticism. I'm talking really narrowly about the issue of onboarding people to the board. Yes, and that actually is still the current issue yeah. but yeah. there were a lot of changes made at that time to the actual ordinances on how the investigations are conducted so you might have been kind of confused in the two yeah um well i just don't i, I don't mean to criticize those areas because i think those are have been vastly improved and that's the feedback i'm getting yeah. but i i did think that this area anyway yes Thank you. <laughs> no problem. You're very welcome. We'll get it done as quickly as we can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to have you on board, too. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry that, you know, <laughs> baptism by fire. Um, <laughs> local government for you. So okay. thank you. That's what I'm here for. Okay. And I think, Virginia? unfortunately, I'm, you all were in budget meetings last year when I first got here because I was trying to find a way to meet you all, and you were so busy. Yeah. <laughs> And Tanya, thank you. And again, same thing. Mm -hmm. Welcome aboard and welcome to, glad to have you here and appreciate this work because it is so vital and, and critical for our transparency and our improvements to the, uh, how we uh, enforce and also 
keep the city safe for the uh, residents. So appreciate that. On the whole on boarding, we have 14 uh, board members, 21 is allowed. Yes. Are there anyone in the pipeline right now that are still, and do we, do we have seven in the pipeline or is it? We're, we're doing good. We have more than seven. We have 10 in the pipeline. Oh, wonderful. That's great. I was wondering, I wasn't sure if we were also short of people in the pipeline. I'm glad we have those seven in the pipeline, getting them through quickly. Love to see that and appreciate yes. the end for your work. Thank no, you. No problem. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. All right. Are, do we have more administrative updates? I think we have a quick update from Laura Buds. Briefer on That's right. Runoff. Important. Hi, Laura. I want to thank you so much. I thought I was going to use that one. <laughs> Council members, we are 15 minutes behind schedule, so I know everyone wants to ask a thousand questions about floods, mm -hmm. but just make sure you don't ask a question that's already been answered. <laughs> And I can, I can be pretty high level and broad here just um, to say that we are continuing to monitor all of the hydrologic conditions and weather and um, getting expert advice from our great hydrologist, Brian McInerney, who's been wonderful to get up in the watersheds. Um, we are taking a holistic look at the city. So, you know, right now, of more, the more immediate concern is Emigration Creek, um, which uh, peaked again <laughs> uh, last night. And um, the forecasted peak was actually higher than what we actually saw, but we are expecting another peak tonight and the following night. So we have uh, a lot of crews that are out and about uh, alongside county crews, uh, cleaning the system, monitoring the system. Also, um, after Immigration Creek uh, ha does its thing this week, um, we are also looking at Parley's Creek and City Creek very carefully and making sure that the debris basins um, above, uh, above Memory Grove are well maintained. Uh, and we also have equipment staged up there because you know, maintaining those debris basins upstream is gonna benefit everyone downstream from the east side of the valley to the west side of the valley um, because of the way that that system runs. Uh, City Creek is just starting to pick up flow, which is a good thing. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, it, it has that measured flow. Um, the weather r that we're seeing right now looks really ideal with these warm days and then we have a cooling off period um, through the weekend uh, before it warms up again. So that's, that's really great. Um, we do have sandbags. Uh, we have sandbag filling stations in Rosewood Park and Rotary Park in the city. And then of course Salt Lake County Flood Control also operates some filling stations as well. I believe there's still some filled sandbags available at Rosewood Park. Um, we'll, we'll go double check that. And then uh, Salt Lake City Public Utilities has two campuses on the west side, our, our Ballpark Neighborhood Campus, as well as our Fifth South and Redwood Road Campus, where we have uh, tens of thousands of sandbags that are filled and ready to deploy. Some of those sandbags are actually already in roll-off trucks, so um, they can be quickly deployed should we need it. Um, I'll also add just on a system-wide basis, uh, we, have, we have a lot of management of the system that, you know, we talk a lot about the detention basin at Sugar House Park right now, and the importance of that, and the detention basins at Rotary Glen and Wasatch Hollow. All of these detention basins are located upstream of the pinch points that are more downstream towards the Jordan River. And so this really is a, a system-wide approach where it looks like we have a lot of activity on the east side of the valley, but really that activity is going to benefit everyone in the city. Um, the, uh, the piped system for the four streams uh, is looking very good. Last night we made some operational changes to the pipe system to um, reduce pressure on the 1300 south. Uh, storm drain as well as the 900 south storm drain. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in the system to manage in real time um, the flows that we're seeing coming down. Um, I should step back and also just let you know how hard all of our crews are working. Um, those operational changes are made in the middle of the night. That's when the peaks of the streams really occur. So we have um, stream teams that are made up of our storm drain 
operations team as well as assessment teams that are out there 24 7 and if you're a night owl you will see them <laughs> out looking at culverts and streams overnight um, Jordan River right now looks great um, the Jordan River is not expected to pose a concern in part because we have a lot of capacity both in the river and the surplus canal um, and the surplus canal will take the flows from the streams further south of us like Big Cottonwood Creek, Little Cottonwood Creek, and Mill Creek. So those haven't actually started running off in earnest yet. When those start contributing flows to the Jordan River, then we're going to see that surplus canal um, fill up more to maintain a steady flow in the Jordan River. Um, but so far from a uh, forecasted runoff and hydrological uh, forecast, it looks like the capacity will be there. I always have to put in a caveat that we don't have control over the weather, um, and you know, so so much so much is going to depend on on how the weather unfolds right now. So that's sort of a high level overview. I know we're over over time. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you yeah. so much for what your crews are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I should um, thank well, all of the other city departments involved too. This is yes. truly a citywide effort. <laughs> so yes. thank you. Thank and the you, county, everybody, for Salt keeping this on top of yeah. your priority list. Yes. <laughs> um, we're going to move on to item number two, which is another informational update. This uh, is an equity update, and I think it's Chris Macias that will be presenting to us today. Hi, Chris. Hello, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I will also try to be brief in the interest of everyone's time. <clears throat> um, and our, oh, my slides are all perfect. So, um, hello again, my name is Chris Macias. I am the Language Access Coordinator in the Mayor's Office in the uh, DEI team. Um, I attended this past week a conference in San Jose, California called Welcoming Interactive as part of the Welcoming America Network, which Salt Lake City is a member of. Um, in this conference, um, the focus was about how to become an actual welcoming local government, uh, specifically with the focus of immigrant inclusion. So we talked about a lot, of, uh, and talked about and shared a lot of policies of how to be welcoming, how to create partnerships, um, how to create government leadership with intentionality of inclusivity. Um, also, meaning how are we how are we be, being accessible to these communities and how, they, how do they have that equ equitable access. Um, for example, one of the things I attended was called Language Access is Right and We Have Responsibilities. So as a local government, what are those responsibilities? What are some of those best practices? And how do we start to implement that as a whole? So it was really great to share all of these different ideas, different assessments, different budgets, budgets different ways of screening. Um, <clears throat> and because we are a member, we get uh, plenty of different benefits. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So one of the reasons that we attended, aside from learning best practices and sharing with each other, was because Salt Lake City uh, is in conversation to become welcoming certified. This is a national recognition um, that is a formal designation for cities and counties so that we can make sure that we have created policies that are inclusive, make sure that we have programs that reflect the values of our commitment to immigrant inclusion. Um, this across the board it provides a welcoming standard so that we can outreach to each other and all of the other welcoming certified local governments to see how we can support each other and also be unique in our own uh, welcoming here in Salt Lake City. Uh, <clears throat> this designation could distinguish us um, in our local efforts to be competitive with other cities or local governments that do not have this and gain access to opportunities um, on a regional, national, and including global stage in partnership with many of the other cities that we collaborate with. Uh, next slide, please. If we were to go through this, the whole process uh, of seeking certification for welcoming, um, we would look at these following areas. <clears throat> they would help us assess our government and community leadership, how are we providing equitable access, our civic engagement, how are we connecting communities, how are we involved with the education in Salt Lake City, our economic development, and are we providing safe communities? And all of these will have definitions and a multitude of criteria underneath them that we will be looking at. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so if 
we're going to go through this process once our conversations are going and once we uh, provide a further debrief, debrief after my visit to San Jose last week. Um, we're going to do a self-assessment that is provided by the Welcoming America Network. It's a series of questions uh, and areas to look at to see if this is something we want to move forward with. Um, it's going to include those uh, areas from the previous slide. Once we complete a self-assessment, we will go through the actual application process. That is a six to 12 month process where we will be identifying not only our areas uh, of inclusion, but also identifying our partners, our stakeholders, um, and other community, including Salt Lake County, which is already a certified welcoming local government. Um, once we go through that application process and collect all of the information, the next step is to have Welcoming America provide an audit of Salt Lake City, and they will provide us with a report. There is a uh, star system of certification, a one star through a five star certification. One star is uh, at no cost to us because we are already members of, of the Welcoming America Network and the cost increases as we go further with that. However, if selected and if certified, then the scholarship from Welcoming America comes back and essentially we will be reimbursed. Um, <clears throat> if that's the case, they will also let us know where we actually qualify. So for example, if we go for a four-star certification but we only meet criteria for three, they will let us know. We can either reapply for three or work on uh, those items that we need to for four, et cetera, et cetera. Not to get too technical, but after that, um, then we could actually receive certification. If that is the case, it is valid for four years, uh, and then during that time, we can work on recertification if we'd like at any point. There is no particular deadline for this application process. Um, I simply wanted to give the update about how I attended there, how the information was provided, and we want to start that just as soon as we can, um, given the conversation happening here. So that is basically the, the update. Thanks, Chris. Uh, council members, any questions on this? Just like in one or two sentences, uh, aside from us being recognized for, for something that I think is in our values, what is the practical benefit of becoming a, what did you call it, welcoming certified city? Welcoming certified, correct. Is it, is it something that like people immigrating to this country or refugees know about and it helps attract people to our city? Or what, what, are, what, are the, what, do you, what would you see as the practical reasons that Sure, good question. I think there's two parts to that. The first being um, how, as I mentioned, we can connect with other cities and other local governments and be able to share some resources in terms of creating inclusion policies. Uh, the example in my lens, of course, being the language access coordinator, is that the language access policy that we have in place was created in part with templates from other cities and then making it unique to us. So that's one example. On the other side, uh, to your point of do, do folks as immigrants and refugees coming to the city know about the certification? The plan is to include that when we say uh, no matter where you're from, make Salt Lake City your home because we have this standard already. And so hopefully uh, with folks who already work in refugee communities especially, they can use this to, to essentially as a marketing tool as well to say Salt Lake City does have these standards and here's why this is a place for you to come. So we hope to make that part of the strategy. All right, thank you. Appreciate your work and the work of the entire equity team. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Chris. All right, we're moving on to item number three, which is a informational update about local historic district reports. We'll have Brian Fulmer from the council policy staff introduce the item. And then it looks like we have uh, Lex and Aiden from planning division here to present some more details. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> this is a briefing about the proposed Laird Heights and Princeton Heights local historic districts in the Yale Crest neighborhood. Lex and Aiden will discuss the proposed districts as well as historic district designation process and where we are in the process. And with that, I will turn it over to Lex and Aiden. Thank you, Brian. Bring up the presentation. Um, my name is Lex Tarman with the Planning Division, and this is my um, uh, colleague, Aiden. Lily and um, we are both are entertaining uh, applications that have been generated from the public for new local historic districts in the Yale Crest area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Salt Lake City, as you know, has a robust historic preservation program. This is a map showing um, the local historic districts are kind of in the purple, and the yellow are the national historic districts throughout the city. Um, we are, again, down in the Yellowcrest area, looking at uh, districts on Laird and Princeton. 
Next slide. This is a map of these proposed districts. In the blue, you have Harvard Heights. That's a, that's a district that has already been designated. Um, in the purple is Aiden's um, application, the Princeton um, Local Historic District. And then the Laird Heights is in the kind of orange color there. Next slide. And this is just another map of the Laird Heights uh, subdivision. Um, uh, local historic district application. Next slide. Uh, again, it's in Yalecrest. It, Yalecrest has the highest concentration of period revival homes in Utah. There are 66 homes involved in this local historic district. There are 68 properties. Two of those properties are just slivers of, of property, um, but they are within located within that boundary. Um, 63 of the 66 homes, or 95% of those homes in the local historic district are considered contributing. So it is a intact um, block neighborhood that um, meets the, the city's criteria for those types of designations. Uh, next slide. Yes, so here's a map of the proposed Princeton Heights Local Historic District. It's located at approximately 1323 Princeton to 15 East along Princeton Avenue. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly to Lexis, as you saw earlier, these are adjacent proposals. Uh, so located in the Yalecrest National Historic District, within this proposal, there are 43 um, principal structures, 45 total parcels, um, but just 43 of those uh, contain structures. 42 out of 43 of these properties are designated um, or are currently listed as contributing to the National Local Historic District. So these are homes that have their historic significance intact and haven't been significantly altered. Uh, all, this is, um, all of the properties within this area are residentially zoned, so they're in the R17000 district. Um, next slide, please. We wanted to talk a little bit about the local historic des designation process um, and what has happened up to this point and why we're here today. First of all, um, we hold a pre-application meeting with a, a, a citizen or a group of citizens who, who live in a neighborhood who are interested in this type of overlay district. And um, we, once that meeting occurs, we send out a notification letter to their proposed area, to ever, all the owners in the area, to let them know that somebody has interest in designating the local historic district. Um, they have 90 days to collect the enough signatures per code to actually um, initiate the application. And that those numbers are 33% of the homeowners in any given area have to be on board in order to even initiate the application for consideration. That has happened in both of these cases. And so we've had an application submitted for both, both local historic districts. And once that happens, we send out a letter again to all of the, the, the owners within the proposed district to let them know that we have indeed received the application and we were going to start to process it. So um, that's up to step number three, or no, step number four. Um, step number five is why we're here today. It's the planning director's report to the city council. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. The, the purpose of, the, really the purpose of this meeting today is to let you know, along with the report that we submitted, that the, the planning division has the capacity to administer a, the local historic districts as proposed, and that's in terms of staff and, and, um, and funding. Um, and that, that's what the, the report you received indicates, that we, for both of these districts, do have the staffing, we do have the funding to um, uh, administer those districts, and basically we're asking for your blessing to move these forward. Is that an official blessing that needs to be given, or is it just a, a like what what exactly are we being asked to? 
<laughs> is it a check-in or is it they need to vote uh, to advance it? They have to officially accept the report. Okay. But we do have to vote for vote on in a public or a uh, formal meeting on accepting this report. I think so. I believe okay. so. And it's been a we'll long check. time since we've had That's had one of these. Like 2017 was the last time. So, um. well, we're, okay. I don't think we have a resolution. We don't. Okay, um, so we'll work with the attorney's office. Regarding the the capacity. Oh. Uh, Katie, yeah. I just was thinking it would be good to look back and see how we did it in 2017 and confirm whether we're doing it the same way this time. Thanks, Katie. Great. A staff, I'm sure, can help us with that. Um, regarding the capacity, so great that there is the capacity in the uh, planning division. Where does that, are it, do the properties in a local historic district contribute to the funding to administer that, or that still just comes from the city's general fund? It just comes from our regular budget and about half of our staff do everything planning related, but also specialize in anything preservation related. Half of our planning division staff? Yeah, in varying degrees. Works on, of the man hours in the planning division each year, Half of them are dedicated. What's yeah? What well, they're qualified. Are, are qualified. Yeah, to do they that. have the background. Work on those applications. Okay, it'd be great to see an idea of how much, like actual. I don't know if maybe we need to wait till the ERP is done, but like how much actual work is done on these versus other projects, by the people that are qualified to do that. Okay. Um, was this your last slide? No, it's not. Okay. You go ahead. <laughs> you want to go to the next one. This was just additional information uh, that Lex has really hit on, but um, through this process, like he said, this has been a, a, a resident of this district has initiated this application and they've gathered 27 signatures from property owners. Um, so what our process requires is 33% of property owner support. Right now, um, we're at about 60% that they've been able to collect. So this is just reiterating it. Um, and then also within our uh, planning director's report to you all, we do have uh, some information where we state that uh, each application that we see typically takes one to five hours of staff time. So we have some estimates on the amount of uh, time that these take and 89% uh, of these are administratively approved so not going to commissions and um, typically over half of these are just approved over the counter so same day or very quick approvals that aren't taking very much staff time. Mr. Chair. Councilman Pui. Quick question on this since you know the, the word signature uh, came, came, came to be and uh, collecting signatures from property owners. Uh, how do you um, verify that the signature is actually from the, the property owner? Yes, so um, the process that we've used is the applicant, they have a 90-day period from when uh, the application is gathered or the first mailing is issued. They have 90 days to go from door to door and gather these signatures. So um, we ultimately don't ask for... Uh, very much proof that this is the person. It's mostly on merit and we check each parcel and who the ownership is um, for each parcel and then align the printed name and the signature. So um, ultimately there isn't a process of verifying each signature. It's on merit. Sounds like Cindy Gus Jensen has. Just a, a quick uh, item that addresses what you're asking about is that usually because the process is so long and there's so much public engagement, they will get feedback if a property owner didn't sign or if a spouse or a partner signed and there's a disagreement within the home. We've had that happen before and then they need to rectify it amongst themselves as is that property owner signing or not yeah, so that, that helps it Thank comes you. out in the wash <laughs> yes. yeah. there. Yep. Comes I have a wash. question on uh, is this uh, ultimately will you guys also apply or will they apply for a national historic district designation at all or is it going to stay local 
Yalecrest is already a National Historic okay. District. Okay, and so these ones are just being added to that overall yes, national yes. and then local. Okay. We currently have five local historic districts located within the bounds of the Yalecrest National Local Historic District, so this would be uh, two additional, so a total of seven. Okay, and, 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 and the reason why I'm asking is because I, I think some of, the na some of these neighborhoods are historic. They have access to other forms of funding, um, either for repairs or things, or even, I'm not sure, for infrastructure, if they want specific type of lighting that the city cannot provide um, you know, outside, like on the public right away, then they may be able to form and then get some money from elsewhere. Did I remember that correctly, or is that an, just a regular SAA? That's SA a little, little, little mix, okay. but you're close. Oh, very close, okay. Um, so the National Historic District is more of a honorary type designation, and there are um, tax credits that you can receive for rehabilitation of structures within those districts. Okay. Um, in terms of the light standards and things of that nature, I that's kind of outside of the realm of okay. this. Of the, okay. But the local historic district designation from the city, um, basically any sort of exterior modifications that occur to a structure once it's in a district or once it's individually listed, um, it requires a review just to make sure that whatever sort of modifications are occurring are historically appropriate. Thanks for that reminder. A couple questions on that. What about additions? Um, to the building and or additional buildings constructed within the district? Do those also have to meet those historic standards? But can they be added? Absolutely. Yes. And does the local historic district restrict use or is it just exterior appearance? It doesn't... Um, they don't have authority to make decisions on use, just okay. exterior building form. So, inside. for instance, an affordable housing incentive program could still be applied, but the, the constructed structure, if it becomes a two-family dwelling, needs to be compatible with that. Could it become larger if it still fits within the zoning envelope? Just has to f match that, or is there... How does... Where does, um, do, do you get my question? Where does that overlay with the, the local historic district restrictions? Um, I mean, we would always want to make sure that any new building, it, even if the buildings to the side of it were two story and we had a four story that building that was proposed, they would have to meet the standards for new construction. Um, and I mean, honestly, we would look at it on a case by case basis. Um, but it would still absolutely be able to happen. Of course, we'd look at exterior materials and massing and bulk um, to make sure that we would put those design principles in place so that it would be um, compatible. Okay. Kind, of, kind of a misconception with historic districts is that you are preserving that district as it sits at this period of time and you, that's not really the case. Additions, new construction, infill development, all of that stuff can happen. We're looking at more of the compatibility of how, the, how those things happen. Okay. Would it be fair, Mr. Chair, sorry. Oh, uh, I think we had a few. So, so yeah. go ahead and then okay. Morton. Thank you for all that. And part of it is that it's the outside facade, especially on the, on the street side of the house, uh, has to be compatible and can't really be structurally changed. You can change the inside of the house so much, but not so much the, the outside of the facade has to be compatible to that historic district. Yeah. That's more important. Just and to add to that, and thank you for adding that clarification. Like, I think if you look around um, the different historic districts, um, you can see how much diversity you can have in terms of housing types, especially in Capitol Hill, where, you know, you can have lots of, his, you know, a whole row of historic homes and then a very, like, modern glass and, like, modern design, not, you know, typical um, of what you would see from other houses in the area. Um, and then I think a lot of people get confused about um, uh, 
what is in a national or national requirements for historic tax credits versus what is required by the local ordinance. So sometimes if you want to get the tax credits, you know, your design that's internal needs to be in a, a certain way or use certain his, approved materials if you want to get the money. But that might not be a requirement of from us yeah. um, in the ordinance. So it just, you know, you, you need to, um, people need to look into it because I think that the perception is that it's much more stringent than it is. And I say that, you know, living in an 1884 Victorian that is like five houses down from a brand new metal and glass house. So. Uh, Councilman Pui, last comment or question? I think that Chris answered the question I had uh, because um, my, my mind went to, wouldn't it be fair that you're constraining use by, uh, by requiring certain materials, right? And the historic materials are more expensive. So you are sort of affecting use um, by this requirement of keeping, you know, the historical structure uh, cohesive, if you wish, with the original structure. Um, so there is that, but you know, this is a different part of town too. So, um, so I think you answered my question. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Brian. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, during this meeting, I pulled up a message that I got from the attorney's office that says the city code does not require the council to accept the report only that the report needs to be presented and then um, also during the meeting I received a message that back in 2018 it was reviewed at the work session just like you're doing today but there was no formal vote taken at that meeting or the formal meeting maybe you if you would like you could take a straw poll on it um, I don't know if that's appropriate or if you want to just leave it as is. Mr. Chair, yeah, I, I think that I would like to let, let the pro, uh, process proceed. I think it's great. This is a neighborhood process, neighborhood led process. They have over 60% on two neighborhoods that are historically significant at 98% or plus. Uh, so I think we should allow the process to proceed. Again, back to the point about the signatures. I think that is all, and you know, the, the, uh, Willingness of the neighborhood also to be participate is it needs to be strong, and I think it is. So I think we should allow the process to proceed uh, and continue on as as through steps four through whatever it is ten. Is there another council? Is there a point at which council does take formal action? Yes. Can yes. We, we go back to that flow chart yes. and let us know what yes. happens after step five. Yes. So the next step after this, we're we'll going back a few slides, if we could, Scott. Oh, there. The one. Yes. So the next step is um, actually to hold a meeting with the property owners, an informational meeting to uh, share more information on this. They have received two mailings, like we previously stated, um, but that will better inform all property owners and create discussions. And then the final step of the process is, after this will go to both Planning Commission and the Historic Landmarks Commission is City Council vote. So you all will go to a vote as the last step, which would adopt these local historic districts what is step eight so the public support ballot ultimately each property owner uh, will receive a ballot where they will vote if they want this to be adopted or if they do not want this to be adopted and that's not the final decision that just informs our decision yes we will bring um, that information to you all and then City Council will take the vote okay Essentially, what you're creating is an overlay zone. You're, you're creating another zoning district yeah. on top of. And essentially, the process with the balloting, like there is, there are a lot of mailers. There are a lot of heads up to every property owner um, meetings um, where we just have straight up Q&A on how our program runs, what we approve, what we don't approve, um, just so that all of these residents that may be in a local historic district get their 
understand our program, understand the regulations, understand the process, and even if they signed on from the beginning to begin this process, which you have in front of you, right, an application with more than 33%, at the end, if they are opposed to it, they can let you know that through their support ballot um, after this okay. robust, all of these robust mailers and engagement. Councilor Pui. Maybe very brief, uh, since you, know, you mentioned that the transparency on this process is made by the amount of work that the city puts through by mailers and meetings and whatnot, um, is there any way to keep track of this, to have an idea of how much ish uh, effort and money uh, we're putting on into uh, making this happen? Uh, I think that would be an important thing. I think it goes back to one of the questions earlier. You know, I think it's important to me to know if there's yes. a way of tracking uh, all of this. I think that would be important. Yes. Um, in the director's report, we've included estimates of what this would cost. Um, so in the director's report, I, my district Lex has several more um, parcels than I do, but we've estimated uh, that the Princeton Heights petition will be approximately $3,296 for the 45 parcels. So that's our estimate for um, what this would look like to process. And that's ma like mailers and, you know, your costs? Yes, yes. So we include estimates for our supplies, um, including the mailers, posters, copies of the application, sign-in sheets, things like this. Is there an application fee? It's there's no application fee. Um, I and we've received this question offline. Um, is it safe to say there are some people interested in us looking with finance at the fully loaded cost to process a district and to process and to operate a district. And to, yeah, to yeah, to process the um, application applications that come in for approval, like building permits do. I would like that information. Me too. Very much. Sure. Okay. Probably less than the fireworks, but yes. Thank you. I, I think my um, the reason for these questions is that I I'm I, we just had a presentation about Salt Lake City becoming a welcoming city and welcoming to diverse populations. And I'm worried that we, in time, there have been cities, and I'm not saying that necessarily is a Salt Lake City, but there have been cities that use local historic districts as a tool for exclusion. And I wanna make sure that that is not our tool, that it's preserving historic architecture, but not preserving historic patterns of exclusionary zoning. And that's um, something that I, I think is a really hard balance to strike. Yes, I would agree it is a hard balance to strike, but the beauties of cities across the world are some of the historic sites. And you're right about the exclusionary side of the house. But there history a, hasn't always been acceptable for all people. Understand. I'm just thinking of the architectural self. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on to the next item, item number four on our... Just to be clear, our marching orders are to move forward with these petitions. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to be clear. <laughs> Thank you. Item number four is budget amendment number six for fiscal year 2022 through 2023. We have Ben Ludke from council staff and Mary Beth Thompson also. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This is the first briefing for budget amendment number six. The public hearing is scheduled for the formal meeting tonight. There are 29 proposed items. The total expenditures are slightly more than $50 million. Of that amount, 11.7 million would come from general fund balance. This would leave fund balance at 23.7% which is $45 million above the 13% minimum target. So a healthy spot to be. The administration has requested two straw polls. I'll highlight those when we get to the two items. And this is expected to be the last general fund budget amendment for the fiscal year. Can we get the revenue table up on the screen? 
It's on page four of the staff report. Uh, green items are above budget, red are below. Uh, you'll see that the licenses and building permits have slowed. They are 1.7 million below budget, but they are more than offset by increases from sales tax and interest income. Overall revenues are $17 million above budget. That's good news, but we are also seeing significant increases from inflation, and you'll see several items in this budget amendment that are asking for additional funding because of those costs. So revenues are up, but so are costs for existing services. Any questions on revenue before we go to individual items? Mr. Chair. Yep, go ahead, Councilman. On the uh, interest income, are we, is that projected for the, for the near term future just because of the way the interest rates are? The interest income line? Yeah, this is a projection based off of what the interest rates are for our investments. And is it, do you think that's going to project f further next year? Yes. And, okay. We so, do. Thanks. Quick, quick question. Is there okay. a little more? Um, maybe a little more sentences behind the licenses and permits and what why that uh, is you know dipping a little bit is there a pattern there or something so the opposite of what council member dugan just spoke about interest rates also affects building permits because building slows down because interest rates are higher so yes we get more interest but we get less building permits because builders can't get construction loans at the cost that they were getting at previously. Any other questions on the revenue side, council members? Valdemaros? Yeah, so Mary Beth, do you foresee kind of like a similar pattern in the next, like are you predicting maybe we start um, budgeting com uh, conservatively because the pattern is that the interest rates are not coming down anytime soon? You know, maybe we need to be cautious, and so don't count with this 1.7 million dollars for from now till I don't know two, three years. Or I don't know. That's correct. Okay. So when you see um, the mayor's recommended budget, okay. you will also see this decrease this, there. Okay. Now remember that this this is this line item is licensing and permits. So that's the permit po portion. When you see the mayor's recommended budget, you'll see the licensing portion as well, which is not down. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mary Beth. Are we moving on to expenditures? So that takes us to the individual items. Uh, we'll go to the table on page seven of the staff report. This is item A1, a request for $291,000 for additional funding to the cultural core spread over six years. And the summary table will show that it's $50,000 in additional funding each year. And this is for year one through year five. And then in year six, it would be $41,000 of additional funding. The surplus fund for the cultural core is like the savings account. So an appropriation from previous years that was not spent lapsed to the surplus fund. The county has a separate surplus fund for their cultural core expenditures. The county council has approved $50,000 of additional funding annually for six years. You'll see that as a separate line in the table. So with the additional funding from the city and the county, there would be $600,000 total in years one through five. It would slightly decrease in year six to $591,000. And in year seven, it would revert to the current level of funding, which is 500,000. The cultural core has had a flat budget of $500,000 since it started six years ago. This funding is being requested to continue the current level of service, knowing that those services cost more because of inflation. There's one policy question. Uh, whether the surplus fund should retain a positive balance to address unexpected costs. Um, this item would fully spend all $291,000 in the city's surplus fund for the cultural core. 
Council member, any questions? Council members, any questions on A1? Okay. Thanks, Ben. Let's move on. Uh, next is A2. And th there are four separate items that are all related. And the staff report and my summary are just going to talk about all four of them together because I think it's easier. Uh, these are items A2, A3, D1, and E3. All of these items are one-time additional funding for Advantage Services to continue providing the mobile clean team at current service levels. The total increase is $533,000, and that's coming from three different funding sources. They're all one-time funds, so the annual budget would need new ongoing funding for the mobile clean team to continue these services next fiscal year. The three funding sources are $300,000 in personnel vacancy savings in the community and neighborhoods department. That's item A2. The second funding source is $160,000 by rescoping funding from the state homeless shelter cities mitigation grant. And this is coming from three different sources, the police department, VOA, Volunteers of America, their street outreach, and the Housing Stability Division. All three of those add up to $160,000. They were for staffing. The funds must be returned to the state if they are not used this fiscal year. And all three of those agencies have said they're not able to use the funding for staffing because they have vacancies. The last funding source is $73,000 from unspent Operation Rio Grande funds. You may remember appro approving this funding in December as part of budget amendment number four. The road home did use $104,000 for the St. Vincent de Paul winter overflow program, but that program has ended with the winter and they were unable to fully use the funds. So there's $73,000 remaining. So $533,000 in additional funding, and it's in addition to the current base budget, which is the ongoing funding year to year. That's $802,000. So this is like a 60% increase over the ongoing funding. Two years ago, the council approved a one-time appropriation for the mobile clean team. I think it was from the CARES Act. It was $760,000 for the mobile clean team. So over that same time period, those one-time CARES Act fund dollars were used by Advantage Services to expand the clean team from focusing in the Rio Grande neighborhood to multiple other neighborhoods in the city. When those CARES Act dollars were fully expended, they continued to provide services in the expanded areas. And this resulted in them incurring expenses beyond the available budget this fiscal year. That's why the $533,000 is requested in a budget amendment. Since the council just approved CDBG at the last meeting, I thought it was worth noting Advantage Services has received over a quarter million dollars from the city's CDBG funds over the last five years for this program, but they did not request funding in this cycle. May I clarify something in the record? Ben, are you, um, is there any implication that Advantage Services was supposed to cut back their service mm -hmm. and not go into those other areas? I think the city expectation was that they would continue their service. They didn't misstep by. No, they, they, my understanding is they're providing the expanded level of service that was requested. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The policy question is if the council would like any additional funding, any additional information about metrics on what the mobile clean team is doing. We do have two metrics. Uh, there were 1,200 requests that have been completed so far this fiscal year. And the time from the complaint or the report being received to it being addressed and closed was four days in March. Councilmember Valdemaros. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I think I think um, this was something that we started a, a long time ago to see if how to like co um, 
complement whatever our streets are doing, whoever is in charge of cleaning our streets regularly, like the regular basic cleanup that we do. Um, and then we needed extra help for um, abandoned encampments or other types of bio waste that it was left over in certain streets or in any sidewalk. But I always had a question since uh, the the um, the money that in cars has been going up and up and up. Like, what's the plan in terms of is are we at some point going to um, to join these two services into one? I mean, combine the services into one. As like, this is a service that we're contracting out. So my question was always, do we need to contract out at this level, or is it something that we can start doing in house so that we can? Um, save some funding because the city already does regular cleanup or the basic cleanup. So that maybe that's something for the administration. I'm not sure if it's uh, our goal is that the cities are clean no matter what for for unsheltered and shelter. Like that's that's a service that the city needs to provide. Now, how do we do it? Do we contract out or do we combine our already existing cleanup crews for you know for the added um, service that we need to? Yeah, unless someone from the administration wants to jump in, uh, we'll ask and follow up with you with their response. Because, I mean, thank you, but you know, that because otherwise you, we have to just budget $800,000 a year for, you know, for the additional cleanup. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do as a city, provide the services, right? And, and keep the, the streets clean uh, and safe for everyone. So in terms of waste and so... That's I, something for us, I, I guess, to think about. I don't and discuss. personally see a way that we could not clean our streets. Right. So this is, yeah, this is maybe this. But, I did, I, Adam, that needs to be <laughs> forever. No, you know? I, I guess the way I see it is if that many, and maybe we can talk about if the provider was efficient or whatever, all those things, but if that's how much it costs to clean our streets and we budgeted way less than that, then our budget was wrong, I guess, is the way I see it. The streets that that eight hundred thousand dollars doesn't seem optional but that's my opinion councilman Pui. I, I mean i uh, i uh, seen the advantage services and you know around my neighborhood a lot um and i'm thankful for what they do um not gonna lie i mean it, it feels like it's need we need more so this fits with you know the request I, as far as metrics though and you know this is not addressing the discussion that you guys have about should we do it in house? Which it will be an interesting question for me as well too. But something that I would like to know is uh, on staffing, because if I remember right, Advantage Services hires uh, uh, the people from our community uh, that sometimes are, you know, trying to get, you know, a stable job for the first time, or or they're, uh, you know, in recovery, or you know, so it's it's a great program, uh, but. Staffing is a problem across the board. Um, so I just want to make sure that we are not six months in and they couldn't spend the money because they couldn't hire enough people. And then we are on the same, you know, the impact on the streets, literally on the streets is not seen. Um, so I wonder if there is a way of getting some metrics from them about how much are they paying? How much? How many openings uh, they have? When are they planning to fill those openings and so forth? How many cleaning teams they have? Um, and uh, and then that will be important for us to know if they either need to pay more money or we need to give them more money or you know all the combination of all of them. Um, so and as far as closing uh, the requests. Uh, I do have opinions about what closing a request means, um, uh, or at least what the, my neighbors are telling me uh, and their frustration about when a, uh, a ticket gets closed. Um, but um, is there any way to document the pickup with a photo in the Salt Lake City mobile app? Uh, so we can upload a photo, and by we, I submit a fair amount of my own requests. Um, and uh, but it would be nice. I think that the visual from from someone like me from seeing a gigantic pile of junk to seeing that gigantic pile of junk gone, I think it will show, you know, that you know the city is at work. I mean, and we know it is. I mean, I testify for this. I mean, I know that everybody's doing their part, but I think the documenting will help people. And I don't know if there's a way of seeing if we can make that happen. 
uh, we'll ask the administration. I, I, there might be technical questions about, you know, whether the current system can do the, the photos out as well as receiving them with. Um, we'll let you know. Uh, one thing to add, the, the mobile clean team does do some work on private property for bio waste removal only. So most of the work is on public property, but when it comes to bio waste, it is available to private property. Is there a fee associated to that? I remember there was like a share fee or something like that. I remember. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. And the, may I? Uh, the, the policy basis for that was that, like with graffiti, where it's a societal issue, that's how this was considered as well, I think. Yeah, and I think r returning to Council Member Valdemoros's point, it is a fee that feels really frustrating for us, to have to, for us to have to pay at this magnitude because we're all familiar with the horror stories of what kind of biohazardous materials being picked up. I actually like the outsourcing of this to professionals who are specifically um, engaged around this material. Um, the key to cutting this expense to me is to address the larger problems around it. This is a, a consequent fee that we're paying. And so if we can get to the heart of more effectively managing what we're seeing on the streets, then this is a consequent fee that goes away. And so I'm willing to dig down with you and work on that issue. One more question, please. Um, can, do you, are you guys, can you just give us a reminder of what these guys, uh, so what, what the service is, is it that somebody, like the hotline where you call and you said, hey, I need, like if I'm, if I'm, a, I'm a resident or a business owner and I need help with bio waste in my property or outside my property, how does it work? Can or, we ask Michelle Hoon to come up sure. and she can speak yeah. instead? I just want to refresh her because I can remember if it's a programmed cleanup or is it on demand cleanup type of thing. Hi, council members. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this uh, really pleasant subject. <laughs> um, so this is specific to the mobile clean team, and what the mobile clean team does is it's SLC mobile request processing. So when you submit an SLC mobile request, when you call in uh, to the uh, Housing Stability Division, and that information comes to my team. Uh, we then turn that over to Advantage Services. We send Advantage Services out. We just strive absolutely to do it same day if we can. If we can't, then our goal is to do it within 24 hours, though there is some gap there, I will say, on the weekends. Um, that, uh, that's the cost that we're talking about here. The on demand, basically, yep. through the Salt Lake City mobile app. Yes, on demand. And to answer that question about the uh, the fee for the bio subsidy, I believe that we're fully covering that cost okay. now. All right, thank you. Are we ready to move on to the next item? Let's do that. That takes oh, us we, to it. Do we need to do a straw poll on that one? Yes. Oh. It was requested. Uh, um, okay. Do you have a trouble? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, I uh, move that we approve the funding for item A2. Okay, the straw poll is to, it's not a motion, the straw poll is to approve this, this fund. You wouldn't actually be approving it since it's a straw poll, but oh, it helps to know that you support or, the item. I move oh. that we support item A2. Okay, everybody indicate your position on the straw poll. I see six council member Fowler is not with us right now. No, okay, so that's six to zero with council member Fowler absent. Next is a four, a request to rescope $823,000 in CIP for the Seven Canyons Fountain in Liberty Park. Back in fiscal year 2020, the council approved $857,000 to redevelop the Seven Canyons Fountain. It had been closed in 2017 in response to code and safety issues identified by the county health department. 
the $857,000 was meant to address those code issues and reopen the fountain as an interactive water feature. The request today would be rescoping those funds to modify the fountain into a permanent dry artwork. The Arts Council would be involved. The dry artwork is expected to include specialty concrete and finishes to represent the seven symbolic creeks flowing from the mountains into the Jordan River. It would also have landscaping and lighting improvements with signage and handrails. The Public Lands Department has consulted with some of the original artists who worked on the fountain. There was an initial feasibility study looking at reopening the fountain, and it concluded that the costs were significantly higher than originally estimated, and that the only option within the existing budget was to entirely decommission the artwork or turn it into a dry artwork. The department went out and did a community survey as well as collected feedback from the public through other channels. And the overwhelming response was not to decommission it, but to turn it into a dry artwork. They did a follow-up second feasibility study to see if it could be reopened using water at a much lower volume. And it looked at three different options, but they were all significantly higher than the existing budget. They estimated $2 million to $4 million to have some kind of water flowing through the fountain. So more than double the current budget. Looks like there's no questions on that one. Okay. The next two items, A5 and A6, these are both requests for parks impact fees for open space property acquisitions. The first $450,000 is for property acquisition related to a city park. The other is $300,000 as a local match to a state grant. Since these are property acquisitions, they're eligible to be discussed in a closed session. Okay. A7, this is a request to recapture $209,000 in one-time funding from the Emergency Solutions Grant authorized by the CARES Act. The funding is coming from two sources. It's $200,000 that was appropriated for the city's expenses to administer the program, and $9,500 from the VOA's Homeless Outreach Program. The deadline to spend these funds was extended by one year by the federal government to September 30th, 2023. So a little less than five months from now. The proposal is to award the $209,000 to Utah Community Actions Homeless Prevention Program. It provides emergency rent assistance. It pays for case managers, salaries, as well as other housing assistance. The Council originally awarded that program $1.2 million. They've fully spent it. And Utah Community Action said that they could use these additional $209,000 by the September deadline. The council did award funding to several other community service providers. All of them but one have said that they would not be able to use this additional funding. The one that hasn't said if they could or couldn't is SOAP to HOPE. They provided street outreach and they fully spent their uh, $200,000 award. So the question for the council is, would you like the administration to check in with Soap to Hope if they could use some of this funding in the next five months or proceed with the recommendation that it go to emergency rental assistance through Utah Community Action? Council members, anyone want to weigh in on that question? I know that community action does an amazing job, so I, you know, and they've been proving themselves. Their, you know, their programs are fantastic. So I, I, I lean towards just supporting the recommendation as is. Okay. Okay. It sounds like we we're gonna move forward with the recommendation. 
Uh, that takes us to A8, a request for $1.3 million from general fund balance for a roof replacement at the Steiner Aquatic Center. The current roof was installed in 2000. This is only half of the total project cost. The city and the county have an agreement to equally split the cost for capital projects, whether it's replacement or for new amenities. So the 1.38 million is the city's portion and the county will provide an equal amount. Is Steiner East or West? Uh, it's on Guardsman Way. Steiner East. East. Yeah, they, they, after rain, there's a lot of buckets <laughs> out in different areas of the, uh, Rec Center. The project schedule anticipates construction over the summer and being completed in the fall. Ben, so the roof replacement will be $2.6 million total, and then we have to come up with 1.3, or is it 1.3 total, we have to come up with half of it? It was the first. The total is about 2.7 million. Okay. 1.3 is the city's contribution, half the cost. Okay. All right. Thanks. What's the lifespan on a commercial roof? Is 25 so, years feels like a, a nice long time for a roof? That's, this one's 23 years. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard 20 is an, a, an average estimate, but it yeah. certainly depends We've on weather. Well. They definitely don't get warranted longer than that, but <laughs> there are also roofs that have lasted much longer than that. And so. it's also, you know, coming from the manufacturing world, you know, these are flat roofs. They have a lot of leakage problems, uh, big, big surface area. And so they fight over years, different small leaks, and then it just exasperates. And then you have to patch them and patch them and patch them. And finally, you just say, I got to redo it all. This feels like completely rational maintenance to me. Yes. Yeah. Because otherwise it becomes more of expensive if it allow roofs to leak. Then you have a lot of infrastructure cost problems, mold, uh, damages that then far exceed just replacing the roof. So is this coming to us in a budget amendment to be drawn out of a fund that we have set aside for reasonable maintenance like this that we maintain? or we just haven't budgeted for this roof, even with the realization that we're probably in the time frame that we should be replacing it. This is coming from general fund balance. It's not coming from a, a separate account specific for maintenance or facilities. You do see in CIP each year a request from the facilities division for ongoing maintenance. It's usually a very large amount, several million dollars, and so it typically only gets a couple million dollars of funding. So there is an amount each year in CIP for ongoing building maintenance and repairs, but this is coming from general fund balance. Okay. And, but could it come from CIP, or is that this year's CIP, it's gone? So it wasn't an application, so it wouldn't be in CIP for this cycle, okay. and I'm guessing if it wasn't approved this year that there's the risk of increased costs from potential leaks or damage related to the roof not working. And do we know why they didn't apply through the CAP funding instead of coming from the general fund? It that it's a, a very precious fund. <laughs> it's because there's a contract between the city and the county. Um, I think Mary Beth has more. Well, what I would say is CIP funding, the majority of CIP funding and the majority of, they're both general fund. It's all, it all is the same bucket of money yeah. when you're looking at it anyway. Um, I think that what happened was the county came forward with their funding, and so they asked the city to come forward with their funding for the roof as well. Um, yes, planning is probably a good thing. It wasn't done on this. We are working that working on planning for infrastructure needs. Thanks. I love to be as proactive on the, these sorts of things so that we're not in a reactive position. And I just wanted to say it isn't embedded in our system yet to look at the life, the practical life of assets, and then schedule their replacement. We're on a different system of crisis <laughs> because our um, CIP funds are not adequate just as a government. I uh, Mr. Chair, qu quickly, I, um, I remember in the county they track the deferred maintenance and they have this gigantic 
amount of different maintenance the county does. Um, the, just a, a random a general question, how it, it was the decision to do this roof because of, it was triggered by the county deciding to pay for their half and then decided, okay, let's pay for our half? Yeah, I believe so, but let, let me um, bring Jorge. Okay. Up, and he can answer this question better I, I, than myself. What I want to get to, uh, I guess the overall question I have is, uh, are there other roofs and, you know, that need to be replaced very quickly? Is the Steiner, uh, you know, west? How is that roof looking like? Or how are the other um, facilities looking like? Are there other uh, urgencies? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. This, this last question is whether or not this roof really needs to be replaced and compared to other roofs. Um, yeah, so definitely this roof needs to be replaced. Uh, it is past their useful life. As uh, Council Member Dugan uh, mentioned, we have patched that roof way too many times and so it is it, it needs to be replaced now the second part of the question as to whether or not we know the condition of other roofs um, we do and we prioritize those as, as uh, safety concerns right um, as Ben mentioned earlier we have um, a good inventory in our asset management software that tells us what is the maintenance the capital asset replacement need every year uh, unfortunately, that is because of years of deferred maintenance, it is too large. Um, and yes, we, we, we know that um, it is a large ask, but it is presented every year uh, in CIP. Um, this year, I believe it was 3.5 on a very conservative side, and um, the recommendation is to be funded at not even 2 million this this year and so it has been the, the story uh, um, over the last three years so it needs to be replaced there are other roofs that are being replaced as well for example the Sorenson Unity Center will get replaced uh, this year as well um, we have replaced fire station roofs over the last two years as well so yes those those are in, on the top of the list yeah I'm, I'm not doubting that the roof needed a replacement that's mm -hmm. not the point here what I'm trying to say is in the overall list of roofs, let's say just roofs, let's stay on that one, right. one topic. In the overall list of roofs, mm -hmm. is this one the highest one up there that we really need to go into a budget amendment right now? Uh, do we have that list? And if, you know, what are the other ones be below this one? Or is there some above this one? That's the question. So, Me yeah, uh, that first part of the question, yes. We want to maximize the 50% that the county is, is um, responsible for. They have secured the money now, and this, this has been an, an issue in the past where they secure their, their side of the agreement, and we are unable to. So we are chasing each other. Unfortunately, the, um, the price continu continues to go up. We have secured the county side. Now it is it's for the city. So we want to maximize that. That's why we are prioritizing it. And now, do we have a list of other roofs? Yes, we do as well. Mm -hmm. I, I've said it before, but I think it's worth making a, a, a plug for a five-year CIP plan. Um, it's called a capital asset plan, and this, this would be one of the tools to look at all of the city's obligations, not just facilities, but parks and roads and fire stations, and look at them holistically over a longer horizon in order to help prioritize and align it with the council's policy goals. That's similar to the library's master facilities plan. Some ways, but for yeah, city it buildings, would be not library buildings. And we are currently working on that. Um, the CAP CIP group in the finance department, we have started working on that. When you see CIP's presentation, you will see the new flow chart for the new CAP CIP group uh, and how it work, how the new process will flow down so that we can get a decent capital asset plan and move that forward to CIP. Great. Yeah. I just just want to put a plug on the on the deferred maintenance side of the house. You know, you always you never have enough money to provide funding for all your maintenance, but if you allow that deferred maintenance to uh, get behind, the next thing you know is that you can never catch up, and you're you're basically never getting catching up, and it's going to cost you more and more money as long run. So we do have to, as Ben said, the five year plan. We do have to start tackling that stuff because we want to at least get to the point where it's neutral. Uh, and not continuously falling off 
because then it becomes so much more a quality of life for the whole city. I agree. We have windstorms that create emergencies, but a 23-year roof when the expectancy is 20, we should be helping them. I know Jorge and his team are working tremendously. We need to be more proactive in helping them get that done in a reasonable amount of time. So, Yep, absolutely. What Cindy's mentioned in the new ERP system would allow you to say, hey, we need to start saving for the, uh, the boiler going out and the roof going out. and Send a plant. Um, we are at time. What are What is our schedule on this item? Do we need to... Um, there was one other item that had a straw poll. Okay. Um, I could jump to that and we Why could stop we there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other item is A11, a request for $50,000 from general fund balance for additional environmental assessment work. Uh, this is a request from the sustainability department, and it's specifically for continuing the work at the Redwood Road former landfill site where a tiny home village is planned. Uh, there is consultant work to finalize a remedial action plan, which then needs to be approved by the State Department of Environmental Quality, or DEQ. This $50,000 would continue that work. Without this funding, the work would be paused until next fiscal year. Some of the funding could also be used for environmental issues at the fleet block. The remedial action plan is just that, it's only a plan. The actual remediation on the site would be done concurrent with construction. There, there was $100,000 in the annual budget for environmental remediation work. Most of those funds have been spent at this site. There was also a small amount used for developing community garden environmental standards and procedures. Mr. Chair, I moved it, or I'd like to make a straw poll that we uh, support. support, thank you, support A11. So I have a quick question on that. Um, oh. So this is, was this $50,000, I'm not sure how to frame, never mind. <laughs> I'll think about my question a little more. Um, okay, the straw poll is to support this $50,000. Yes. I have a question, hold on, yeah. sorry, I was out, like, sorry, 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 sorry. We're all trying to think of our questions. Yeah, one moment. Our agreement with this project was to pay for all of the environmental assessment requirements for this site. And let's say they did some sampling and then it went over budget because they need to do additional sampling. So we have already agreed that we're doing this. So we have to come up with the money to help or were there other funding sources for this? that wasn't city's funding sources. The city is fronting these costs and the agreement with the future operator of the tiny home village is that they would be reimbursed to the city. Okay, that's our agreement. That's in writing, it's in a contract. We're gonna get this money back. Yes. Great. Thanks for reminding me that was, I knew there was something there, but I couldn't quite remember. <laughs> Great, thanks. All right, so the straw poll is to support this $50,000. Um, show, okay, that's six to zero with Councilmember Fowler absent. All right, so um, I guess we'll move the rest of this budget amendment to another week. Next Tuesday? I know that next week's Tuesday is going to be real busy, but. The, the council's not scheduled to adopt this until June 13th with the annual budget. Uh, so if next Tuesday doesn't work, there's, okay. there's other Tuesdays. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Mary Beth. We are moving on to item number five. This is an informational update on the proposal for investing in the Perpetual Housing Fund of Utah. This is the proposal for $10 million of the city's allocated American Rescue Plan Act dollars. We have, I, is the mayor here? I just barely sent you a message okay. that you probably haven't seen, but uh, oh. Rachel's gonna fill in for the mayor real quick. Okay, great. So we have um, Rachel Otto, 
Jennifer Bruno, and then Chris Parker and Ashley Atkinson from Give Development here to present on this. Go ahead and come up, and I think we'll give the mayor's office the first sort of word if you're if you'd like. Thank you, Council Chair and Council Members. Um, I'll be very brief, and thank you for letting me uh, sit in for the mayor here for just a moment. Um, I first of all just want to thank the council for your very conscientious work around all of the rescue plan allocations and your patience with the administration as we've worked through a lot, um, a lot of ideas, a lot of goals, and a lot of work with our partners at the Perpetual Housing Fund of Utah um, to bring you this exciting proposal. And um, just to remind you of where we started with this a couple of years ago at this point, when the city first received notice that we were going to get a significant amount of rescue plan funds, um, the mayor, her, she really took some time to set out what her priorities would be and how to present those to you. And as I'm sure you probably remember, the biggest priority was revenue replacement and making sure that the city remained whole uh, through the pandemic and all of the financial ups and downs that came along with that and the financial uncertainty. The second issue was um, really the most, the city's most urgent needs, so public safety, housing security, and addressing homelessness. And then the third category that the mayor really has felt strongly about focusing on uh, was building a lasting generational change for families in Salt Lake City. And um, as you know, as you've been on this journey with us over the last couple of years, we've had a couple of iterations of that and um, are excited to start talking with you in more detail today about perpetual housing and the change that we think it can bring to families in Salt Lake City um, over the next several decades to make sure that you know, we're all benefiting from the astronomical growth that we're seeing in the city and that we're not continuing to leave families behind who can't access housing and who are struggling to keep up with rent and rising costs as I know we all are very focused on that in our work here at the city. So I'll hand it back to Jen and then to Chris and Ashley from the Perpetual Housing Fund. Thank you, Rachel. Jennifer Bruno for Council. Thanks, Deputy Rachel. Director. I'll just give a really brief introduction as it relates to the city context, so as it relates to the city um, tools and logistics. Uh, budget Amendment Number 6, which you just discussed, actually includes this proposal. So that's where this proposal um, is living from the perspective of Council approval or not, so it will be heard in the public hearing tonight and considered um, on June 13th unless you defer action. Um, the dollars um, that the city received from the federal government through ARPA have mostly been spoken for, although the proposal proposal is to spend the remaining $10 million um, and the city must spend those dollars by December of 2024. Um, affordable housing development is an allowable use under ARPA, um, and this proposal uh, anticipates that the dollars will be spent by mid-2024, which will meet the city's um, deadline to spend those dollars. The city's dollars would essentially be invested with a third-party nonprofit, the Perpetual Housing Fund of Utah, uh, to use money as seed development and uh, seed money to facilitate the development of a unique housing product in the market um, for affordable rental units. While this proposal is not technically structured like a community land trust in the traditional sense, um, some council members have pointed out that it does provide a similar path for renters uh, of affordable units to build equity in ways that they otherwise wouldn't, as well as receive um, yearly rental rebates. Um, the concept of sharing equity with renters in addition to investors has been a policy interest of multiple council members uh, in different ways over a number of years, including the community land trust uh, administered by hand and the West Side Community Initiative administered by the RDA. So it's in line with some of those programs, although it is a separate and distinct um, proposal. Um, and the logistics of each program works slightly differently. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Chris Parker and Ashley Atkinson to go over how the tool works um, in general and then what the city can expect um, in the immediate and long term uh, with this investment. Thank you, Jennifer. Council members, are there any questions before Chris and Ashley get started? Okay, thank you for being here. Go ahead and... Uh, hi. These are your, your slides, right? Uh, yeah, if we can. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Chris, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about Perpetual Housing Fund with this group. We really appreciate your consideration uh, of this program. We think it'll help a lot of Salt Lake families um, have a revenue source and really build generational wealth that they could not have in any other way. 
Um, as comes as no surprise to anyone in this group, um, maybe we could advance the slide one. The difference between owning a home and not owning a home is one of the most pronounced and often the most pronounced thing in a person's life as it relates to how much wealth they might generate over that life. You have, and these are 2019 numbers, so these have actually gotten worse over the last three years, a 40x expected net worth and actual net worth uh, if you own a home versus if you are a renter uh, in the United States. It is, it is the single biggest differentiator between those who might end life with a nest egg that can support them through retirement or pay for their children's college or create some sort of generational loop that is beneficial instead of a generational loop that is not. Um, next slide. The problem uh, with the truth of homeownership being the single biggest economic factor in, in someone's wealth creating life is that the ability to own a home has very strongly eradicated over the last three to four years uh, in Salt Lake City and Utah, generally speaking. Um, in Utah, only 11% of the homes were affordable even to the median income of Utah in this past year. Uh, and, it, and it's slightly rebounding, but not much. Um, the ability to have something of an on-ramp to the American dream is becoming very scarcely um, available to the majority of Utahns, not just those who might start in a, a lower or moderate economic class. Um, next slide. Federally, um, we support affordable housing uh, you know, relatively strongly in this country uh, to the tune of about $40 billion. Um, but in most years, at least prior to the Trump administration, um, the bigger subsidy we give for housing broadly in this country actually goes to upper and uh, upper middle income families in the form of the, uh, the write-off that you have for the interest in your uh, mortgage. The reason we do that, I think, is fairly sound. There's an idea that owning your home gives a certain amount of stability, and that also owning that home um, is the way that you might handle later in life expected, uh, expenses and generally generate wealth over time. Um, we give almost no subsidy to the middle uh, group of Utahns or people in this country that are making just a little bit too much uh, for more traditional federal subsidies but can't quite afford the home, and that group has grown to be a huge percentage uh, of Utah and Salt Lake City um, specifically. And we do have some affordable housing programs uh, in this country. The trouble with these programs, uh, while they're desperately needed and do good work, is that we satisfy ourselves with the uh, subsidy we give to lower income households with simply giving them a one month uh, roof cover, more or less, an injection of cheap rent that makes sure that they're not on the street. But that subsidy doesn't go to generating the sort of wealth that the upper income subsidies we have typically do. So the people most at need uh, in having some health generating wealth and getting maybe out of an intergenerational poverty standpoint are the ones that our subsidies do absolutely nothing to help in that regard. And in fact, many of these programs uh, have caps on how much money you can make, a true social safety net instead of something like you'd want it to be a trampoline. Um, next slide. Uh, density should be able to help this. Um, generally speaking, if you are building a single family home and your land cost begins at $150,000, uh, there's really no algebraic equation that ends in an affordable house. Um, you, you simply can't construct something that uh, would approach a mortgage size that the uh, even typical now uh, Salt Laker could afford. Density should be able to help that by reducing your average land cost per unit into the tens of thousands instead of the hundreds of thousands. Um, however, uh, next slide, we do not see that actually happening in practice. And the reason for this is condo development, which should be the individual owner development option for multifamily, um, generally isn't happening in this state and certainly isn't happening in Salt Lake. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a liability concern for a lot of developers um, that has, has recently kind of overtaken in the last four or five years. Uh, there's a, a profit motive that simply isn't there over, over a regular multifamily for rent product. Uh, and generally, these are just exceedingly hard to do. Banks don't want to do them, architects don't want to do them, and contractors don't want to build them. And so unsurprisingly, though we have this tool of density that can help us with our affordable housing problems, it is not being used. All of these very dense buildings that are being built all over this city are accruing wealth, almost like a dike in the ground, to 
perhaps 50 uh, development firms that control almost the entirety of development in the state. So we're getting affordable, more affordable rents, although even that is getting more difficult to find. But all of the wealth generation from real estate, which used to be the thing that made the middle class, is actually accruing to the top 1% or more in the way that it's being built right now. Um, next slide. One way you might be able to, sh to kind of bend that reality into something like a wealth generation model for the middle class is to have shared ownership models of actual apartment buildings. Rather than trying to give everyone their own condo, which is hard to do, uh, you could just build buildings the way that the market seems to want to build them and then redistribute uh, you know, some of the revenues, all the revenues, a large portion of the revenues of these uh, structures to the residents that actually live in those buildings. Um, go ahead, next slide. What that would do is it would allow the, the middle percentage of uh, those who can afford market rent but cannot afford a home to go ahead and have some level of equity generation. Uh, what that leaves is this lower um, segment of the population that can't really afford market rent that are housing uh, scarce or housing insecure. Um, how do we go ahead and, and try to give them the same benefits uh, that the upper two groups have, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, there is a program that is set up to provide affordable housing uh, in this country. There's a lot of buildings that use this program in Salt Lake City, uh, and that's the tax credit model. Basically, federal government gives tax credits. Uh, you sell those tax credits, and you're able to have lower debt on a structure. Um, therefore, you're able to charge less rent. And it's, it's a great model. It's the most successful housing model the country has ever had. Um, however, uh, if we look at the next slide, the downside of it is that while we are providing affordable rent, which, which again, very needed thing to do, um, again, all of, the, all of the equity generated in those buildings over time as AMIs rise, as mortgages get paid down, accrue to developers, their investors, you know, parties that are constructing these, not necessarily living in these buildings. Uh, and so PHF's model, in a word, uh, on the next slide, is taking that pre-existent model and making the majority of the profits generated, uh, whether that's on an annual basis or when a refinance happens or when a property is sold, actually accrue to the uh, low and moderate income families that live in these buildings, giving them the sort of nest egg that they might have experienced were they to own a home. Um, but in a way that is accessible, that requires no down payment, that requires no perfect credit score, that doesn't require you to be able to qualify for a $4,000 loan, which is what the median house now costs at current interest rates. Um, this is a, a truly innovative model that takes all the benefits of multifamily apartment development and that efficiency and combines it with the uh, wealth sharing model that used to be reserved for condos and single family homes. Um, so we'll talk a little bit on the next slide about, uh, and maybe even one more, um, about what this looks like in practice and what Salt Lake City's uh, specific investment would be funding for the city. Um, Perpetual Housing Fund will do this in other areas of Utah as well, um, but this is just talking about what would happen in Salt Lake City directly with the city's money. So to summarize Salt Lake City's investment, um, the $10 million is an investment. So Salt Lake City would receive 2 to 6% return on that money every year. And at the end of the 20 years or at some point in the future, that $10 million would be returned to the city. Um, Perpetual Housing Fund is promising 1,000 equity sharing units in, within Salt Lake City. Um, in the next 10 to 15 years. And we'll talk about how um, we plan to do that on the next slide. But the $10 million will be um, all used for, for units that, um, are, that are affordable to those making 65% AMI and below, um, because that's an ARPA requirement. And then there are another 500 condos um, that we're going to work with Rocky Mountain Homes Fund on some of those, and PHF will do. Um, some of those that are for higher 60 to 100 percent AMI. Um, in the same buildings, we want buildings with mixed income, um, but the ARPA funds will not be used in anything above the 65 percent AMI. Um, the next slide shows how we're planning on getting those 1,000 units and the 500 units. So um, there's the 515 project um, that we'll probably talk about later that you guys may have seen in the, um, in the presentations. 
And that will be our first project. That'll be a combination of 100 or more condo units, um, up to 120% AMI, and then two 9% phases um, with a possible third phase in the future. Um, in that 515 building. And then in addition to that, we plan on four, on four, 4% or 4% and 9% 20 projects over the next 10 years um, to get to that thousand units. And those would all be in Salt Lake City. Next slide. <laughs> um, these are the pro formas. We can talk about those more in the questions. Um, but the next slide shows a little bit um, we can. This shows um, how the numbers, are, how we're getting to those numbers on the pro forma. So a resident pays their rent just like a typical LIHTC project. Um, the project pays its expenses, its operating expenses, its capital reserves, and its debt. And then there's net cash flow at the end of the year. That net cash flow, 75% of that net cash flow goes to the tenants. 25% comes back to PHF to help us operate and grow. Um, there's also the equity in the project. So from developing the project, there's instant equity. Um, there's also equity as the project stabilizes and the asset um, grows in um, equity, the asset value grows, and then the debt reduction um, as we're paying the loan down. So 75% um, of that is also going to the tenants. That is not realized immediately because um, that is tied up in the project. So that will be realized at a future um, refinance event um, sometime 10 to 15 years. Um, and so the four ways that tenants are getting back, um, back their money is first the cash flow um, that I just talked about, second the equity um, at the refinance event 10 to 15 years down the road. Third, um, we are going to donate a part of the developer fee into a HELOC type vehicle. Um, so the residents, if they have a qualifying event, if they want to go back to school, if they want to buy a house and they need a down payment, if they have a medical emergency, they can pull a piece of that equity that's still tied up in the building to use um, for one of those events so that they aren't going into debt for one of those events. And then the fourth way is our partnership with Rocky Mountain Homes Fund. They can trade their equity for a down payment in a Rocky Mountain Homes Fund or a PHF condo. Um, we can skip this slide. That just shows the opposite, um, the developer point of view. This uh, slide shows at the bottom. So this shows how the asset appreciates over time. Um, at the bottom, it shows um, three different scenarios. So resident A lives in the project for 10 years. Resident B lives there for three years. And then in that same unit, a different resident moves in for seven years. So if the refinance event occurs at the end of 10 years, um, you can see that we're splitting the equity equally over the 10 years and someone, even though the refinance event doesn't happen and the money isn't paid out until year 10, the person that moved out at year three is getting their share of the equity. Um, the rest are kind of just appendices in case we have questions. So I think we can turn it over to questions. Thank you. Uh, council members, do you have questions on this? Council Member Dugan. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It was nice to hear it twice in, in like a short period of time. So I actually got more this second time. So thank you. That just shows you how slow I am on some of these things. So I appreciate all this. But I, I, I'm going to go back to the questions that we were, I presented uh, last time where we talked about. You know, I, I love the idea of the, the cash flow, and I, I, I would still like to because that's an annual cash flow uh, basis, I'd like to continue to explore how we can make sure that money is actually invested and not used for, um, for, for to grow their equity. The, the second thing is, this is a wonderful vision and I think a wonderful project in one sense, but when I look through, and then when I look through my eyes and I go, well, I've, I've understood finances, I understand uh, a budget, and I understand how to spend money and save money, um, but uh, that may not be the case of all people, and how we make sure that uh, the individuals that are benefiting from this 
understand and are maybe are provide some training or some mentoring on budgeting, uh, finances, uh, the cost of saving early so that your revenue grows, you know, later on, you know, uh, and how we make sure that piece of this is uh, firmed because it doesn't really do us any good if we don't have any training to back up what we're trying to do to them. So I just love it, but I would like to make sure that we have that mentoring program that's working with the, with the uh, renters or the tenants. We, we completely agree. And, and I think especially before cash payments start going to residents, I do think we're, we've budgeted in our operating expenses to have a sit down about you know, how you might go ahead and approach getting a large sum of money uh, and the, the appropriate ways of spending that. And, and uh, at the end of the day, it will be their money. Uh, but I completely agree that making sure that what is a potentially very large um, equity event for them doesn't does, doesn't gets treated with a certain level of, of uh, potential life change that it can be. That's the entire reason we're doing this uh, system. So we should make sure that it actually works. Okay, I saw Council Member Puy, then Valdemoros, and then Petro. I, I, you know, I just want to say I, again, also to to. Um it's nice to hear twice, very close to each other, so I can, you know, uh, understand it better. And I, uh, it is true that this is not happening. I mean, how uh, home ownership uh, for most families, it's, it's almost impossible at this moment. I mean, I cannot afford my own house if I wanted to buy it today, I think. Uh, so that's kind of crazy. Um, and I appreciate this, this concept, and I think it is a very good uh, use of, of ARPA dollars to create a significant change for the next, um, I mean, the next decade. And, and that means uh, hundreds of families are able to, to own uh, and to keep and capture some of that equity that uh, is so valuable. Uh, and this is not only for people that know how to save money and how to, you know, there is a lot of us a lot of in my community that do know the concepts and they know how to save money. I mean, I, I don't think there is a better person to to manage a budget than, than poor people, uh, let me tell you. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, but it is about having the tools and, and the market is not catching up with, with, with income levels and the market, the price market of, for houses is in the opposite direction. Uh, so I think this might be a very interesting option for for those ARPA dollars that we have in the city. So thank you for the update. I just wanted to say how creative and how awesome that we can look at different ways of doing wealth building as the city and as we've been talking for a while. So I think this is super interesting. Um, I'm, I didn't have the chance to have that meeting, so I would like it still so that I can be more familiar with it. Um, you know, one of the things, like, if I put myself in the renter, like, when I was a renter, when I was, you know, um, when I was uh, a young professional uh, renter, you know, it, uh, I didn't have this hope, you know, like, like it, it wasn't, like, it wasn't an option. The only option was, like, well, hopefully one day I'll buy a house, you know, or, or condo or whatever. So it was never, so I was never really paying attention that much. I didn't have the... Nobody told me about budgets, what I needed to be saving for, what I needed, you know, my credit, all of the thing. And I wish I had that so that I could get into the housing market earlier. But with this, it seems like we're providing an opportunity for those. And also to learn about things that I didn't know before, which is, you know, when, when you own something or at least, you know, you're getting some money back, you also need to plan ahead on, on roof repairs and on facade repairs and on plumbing repairs and all of the things. And I think once people understand that, you almost start thinking, like, you're more serious about, like, where you live at and you start, like, planning and budgeting and knowing that you, you know, that this piece of um, building, it's, it's yours, you know, at some point, I think um, it will bring a lot of, a lot of benefit, uh, not only for the city, for the building, but for those that will be able to get something back and, and be really into it, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So I appreciate this. I, I think it's a great investment with this generational investment that we need to do. So um, I want to hear more about it. Thanks. Councilor Petro. Councilor Petro. Um, I'd like to remind us all that I love, I love the project. I have done professional research on shared equity models, and I am glad that we're finally getting one here in Salt Lake and the opportunity to invest in this. We are not saving anyone. We are participating 
in the rightful act of correcting historical wrongs whereby home ownership and generational wealth development has been deprived. No one needs us to give them financial counseling. I am glad that we consider it as part of a package. The people who will show up to take part in this are people who rightfully are being served by their community to correct historical wrongs. So I just want us to be real careful. We're not saving anyone here. We are doing what is right. I am thankful that this perhaps is even a costly moral action for you all to stand in the gap to do. I want to acknowledge that there are people of color who have been working towards this in these communities as well, who still need the opportunity to participate in the ways that are rational to them to fix this issue. But I want us to be real careful about how we discuss this and how we discuss the people who will benefit from our rightful action here today. Council members, any other questions? If not, I do have a question. Um, so I, I, I've heard this a few times now, and I'm getting a little more information every time. Let me ask the question, what happens if the project goes poorly? Think construction costs skyrocket, some ancient burial ground is found, and <laughs> all the other things happen, and you have to get a $3 million RDA bridge loan and whatever else. Um, and so there's additional debt service, monthly debt service that is required. Let's say all those things happen. I assume the first thing that stops is that there's no cash flow or there's less cash flow. So that amount to the renter is less, right? I think the first stop would be the developer fee. We would put the developer fee, um, like if co construction costs went too high or something happened that we didn't know, um, on the bigger projects, there is quite a big uh, developer fee that we would put ahead of before that happened. Yeah, and I, I think there's, there's, there's the two risks. There's during construction, um, which uh, all of our budgets have uh, standardized contingencies, which would get touched first, and as Ashley mentioned, a developer fee would come next, and then... Uh, you know, potentially it would be after all of those events that we would have, uh, you know, some sort of issue. I, I, we, we've built a lot of these, or at least I, I personally, with another group I have, have built a lot of these. And so, you know, knock on wood, we've, we've, we've been able to navigate those well. Um, during the actual project, uh, let's say that, you know, value of, of real estate goes down. Um, that actually is yeah. one of the real benefits of this model is right now there are probably hundreds, maybe thousands, but definitely hundreds of people in the city that bought nine months ago or bought a year ago and have watched their home value erode. And that's a leveraged home value. And so that might end up being a very poor economic choice for them. That 25% uh, eats all of that economic downside before the residents get touched at all. And it also, when we have a refinance event, let's say you get a 75% mortgage, 100% of the cash of their share gets refinanced and to them uh, before PHF gets anything. And so in the event of a bad event, we have made, we, you kind of have all of the benefits of ownership economically with literally none of the downside. No one, no one will see their money go down because the project has an operational problem. Um, so it, it, we're, we're excited case scenario, about that protection. They were, worst case scenario was what we're already doing, which is providing an apartment at an income restricted level and there is no equity event. No, correct. And assuming, and assuming everything went wrong. No, I guess absolutely. the question is what happens with the $10 million ARPA dollars in that case, if at all we invested in this project, we realize there's some fatal flaw and it like doesn't work, which has happened with affordable housing ideas in past generations. Um, and would I know that there was like a the city was in was was guaranteed a two to five percent return at over the next ten years, but like how, I, I'm, that's the piece that I'm not quite understanding. How does the city get paid back sure. on that? No, happy to answer that. Uh, basically, the city's money and what's really unique about how this money works is that it isn't tied in a specific project. So typically, a lot of municipalities, uh, counties, states have 
been at the very tail end of a project where they give gap financing, very needed in many cases, gap financing that attaches to a project for 40 years. What this fund actually does, it gets in at the beginning of the project so that it's doing different deals, but also it means that your, you know, collectively the city's uh, $10 million really is only involved in the early stage acquisition and pre-development expenses and the general building of something. The actual operational expenses don't will never be touched for the $10 million in ARPA money. So this isn't just kind of a freewheeling account that PHF will do what it pleases with to subsidize losses. This is a development account to produce as many affordable units as we can and make sure that the wealth of those go to the people it is. So the 2 to 5% that the city gets operates in a couple ways. The, the city is either going to have uh, its money in one of two places. Either it's going to be in the early stages of a project, in which case we imagine the city, just like any other construction uh, loan or equity event, would be making a, con you know, a discounted but construction level return that the project would pay, um, just as if it had gotten money from any other source. It's a reduced source, thank you, um, that allows really that wealth to move on to the tenants. Uh, but the construction event is really what generates those returns. And then when it isn't in a project for probably a pretty brief period, it'll be in an interest yielding bank account, which is above the amount that's being um, promised as a floor to the city. So in either cases, it's a revenue generating uh, asset um, that is better than market for everything it is doing, but is always accruing some level of interest on the construction side of the deal, not necessarily the operations side of the deal. Okay. And if the city wanted to divest, it would be that repayment over 10 years or so? It's structured as, is it structured as a loan? It's structured as a, you're really, you're not investing in a specific building with this money. You're investing in a different development entity, really, that builds the type of buildings that gives away all its money. I mean, more or less in a, in a nutshell. And so it, it, it will sit there and when you do divest, if you want to, at the end of the ARPA regulation, It'll just come from a development account. It won't attach to any of the projects that have been built over that time frame because it never got used. And that's one of the real uh, beauties of the model is, you know, LIHTC deals, generally speaking, when you break ground, no longer have any actual equity left in them. The tax credits have replaced the traditional equity that a normal real estate deal would do. And so this $10 million just rolls and does a good thing, comes back, does another good thing, but it never diminishes. And that allows it really to create this sort of outsized impact of, you know, a thousand units versus the 50 or 100 it might have done otherwise if it were just gap financing on the back end. So uh, it kind of just goes and it rolls around until such time as the city decides it would like it back, um, in which case, thank you. And you'll, you'll get your money and all the returns for that period as well. We, we are strongly committed to creating not only equity for residents, but creating models for the city itself to not diminish its capacity to fight what will be a growing need for housing in the future. It's important to us that there is a return to the city with these funds rather than just being given away. Um, and so hopefully, you know, the 10 million to go back and you'll also have a lot more money that's been made over that time frame that you can further use for whatever you'd like, but hopefully housing, I'm biased. Is it fair to characterize us as part of the cash stack for building? Te temporary, the construction cash stack. It will not be in the permanent cats cash stack. And then the ten million at the end of that, we reauthorize the use again for the next. When you're saying it goes to the next one and the next one, we reauthorize each one. Or your, it's not anticipated that you would do a project by project reauthorization. You would do a blanket early stage authorization of a type of project. <clears throat> And as long as the next project type were this thing that you had already authorized, it would just naturally flow without, without your input. And are all, of, are all of the different things you're talking about, the things that we saw planned out on the calendar, like all of those projects, or are they potential future undisclosed projects that we don't know about right now? There, there's two proposed immediate projects. What we wanted to do is show how a thousand, a thousand units sounds like a really big number. And we wanted to show how how that might lay out over 10 years. Candidly, I, I would like it to be earlier uh, than we've shown, but what that was, what that wanted to show is that, you know, one 4%, and sorry, 4%, 9% vernacular, the two types of tax credit um, applications for people that aren't wonks on, on housing tax credit finance law. Um, 
you know, really with doing one of those every couple of years and then with doing a similar amount of 9% every couple of years, you get to that 1,000 units. We would like to see that accelerated, but we, I, I don't want to come up here and promise a bunch of things that have a bunch of, uh, you know, things we're hopeful for but can't promise. Yeah, if we're going to go beyond the scope of what we're seeing, I'm especially if we're creating opportunities for equity development, if we're creating opportunities for home ownership, if we're diversifying the housing landscape, especially if you're into geographical distribution so that people can choose what neighborhood they live in regardless of their income. All of those things are great, but I would really need tight MOUs on if we're not voting every time for that reinvestment on how that's governed and, and how the city as an apparatus monitors that because while, you, while you're an awesome person, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow and the organization goes on without you. <laughs> so. I, I don't like that there's two people in that, in that scenario. <laughs> it's, 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 I come from nonprofits, and that's always a thing. Like, if you get hit by a bus, how does your org continue? So, but, you know, if, if, that, if that happens, like, we need more than, like, our trust in a personality. We need really, really strong parameters to protect the citizens' money and the citizens who would be there, in there. And we would welcome that. Mr. Chair, maybe I could chime in just, sorry, Gordon. just from a city logistical yes, perspective. Um, in the staff report, it lays out a number of proposed um, conditions that the RDA would have a contract with um, PHF. Um, they're inviting council feedback on those conditions. So if you wanted to take a look at those, um, maybe that would be uh, helpful because um, I think it speaks to your uh, request of next steps. And I probably should have mentioned that from the beginning. This money would be administered by the redevelopment agency. Um, you're considering it as the city council because the city received the $10 million ARPA grant. Um, but just from your hats perspective, that's how it would flow. Thanks, Jennifer. Councilmember Warden. Um, so I definitely need the presentation at least one more time, maybe a couple more. Um, but so I want to ask more about the 515 project. Um, so will the 38, this is in the staff report, will the 38 units um, in that project be spread around? Because it, it seems a little um, confusing about whether they'll only be on floors two and four or whether they'll be throughout the building. Yeah, and, and we actually, we, we've to. modified a, okay. a model on that, which we're, we're happy to share. It's, it's in our current presentation. Okay. We were trying to show, like, the chunk. Got it. But, no, it's anticipated that, you know, every third or fourth floor, you'd have a floor of PHF, and then you'd have a floor of traditional condos. Okay, and then does, does it also address, um, like, separating, um, well, I guess it would be pretty hard to do that if they were spread around the building, but, um, like... In your, for example, in, in the um, GIVE project, you talk about um, like democratizing some of the amenities that you have there. Will that be a component of this project as well? Yeah, the, there will not be anyone living in the building that has any different lifestyle or amenity package or view than anybody else in the building. So your neighbor, you will know nothing about them that they're your neighbor on any given floor as far as their income. Okay. And then this, I'm only like a quarter joking, but will there be enough money in this project to do like a mural on this building as well? Because that would be amazing, like you've done with some of your other projects. I, I love public art. Um, as do I. And it's not the best building in town. So <laughs> it's not the worst. It's not the worst. It's not the worst. But there's plenty of room. <laughs> I, I, you know, what's interesting about that, the, the older structure is I have a lot of uh, you know, friends involved in architecture that adore that building. Um, and so I, <laughs> so I, 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 love I, the, I love the honesty too, but um, <laughs> if, if we're being honest, as long as we're being honest, I would honestly love what I, I, more. I, 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 I can't <laughs> promise this, uh, which was why I didn't immediately bring it up, but we're currently studying actually having um, uh, what will be basically a projection head built in the front to have art projected on the side of the building on a rotating. It wouldn't modify the structure itself, which is a very, I mean, that architect wanted it to be one color, and, and it is, for better or worse. It, it yeah, very much check is. that box. <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, I, I think a really nice projection apparatus where you could change the type of art happening on the building on the side of it would be a nice blend between uh, people who think it might not, you shouldn't paint brick, and, and people who are like, that's a lot of brick. 
So I hear you. Thank you. So I, I think we probably all still will have some questions. Appreciate this um, presentation and the pre-presentations, and it sounds like post-presentations that you'll you'll be doing. Um, I think some of the questions that it sounds like we have are: What does that actual contract look like? What are the off-ramps from that contract if and when the city decides that this isn't the model that they want to continue investing in? I, you know, what? How does that look? Um, and what are those sort of agreements? Uh, it sounds like that's in our staff report, so we have some homework to do, and then maybe that's a um, point for some more discussion. But just a reminder, this is in the current budget amendment, and it was June 14th. So the public hearing would be tonight, and you could actually act at any point until June, I believe it's 13th, which is the night you adopt the annual budget, unless you decided to um, defer action on it for some reason outside of budget amendment number six. So it sounds like Councilmember Fowler had a yes, question. There is one additional question if you're okay Go with ahead, that. Yeah. Um, uh, Councilmember Fowler wondered, um, there have been recent legislative efforts to um, allow renters rent payments to help build their credit score. Um, and she was wondering if this project could help towards that or if that would still require state legislation. We, we use that on all give projects and anticipate using it here. Okay, I, I don't understand the question. Or the is it answer, just a reporting it thing? Like, or Yeah, it okay. basically how it used to be is uh, payments on a mortgage would, re would record to your credit score, but payments on rent wouldn't. Right. And so we've made it so positive payments on rent report to your credit score. Great. So it's a voluntary developer thing. Oh, so That's interesting to know. Building owners and managers can choose to report to credit agencies. But yeah, they're not well, required and, and to. We, we actually, it ultimately arrested the tenant. So we have an opt in that okay. if you would like your rent to be reported on your credit score to build credit, you may. Really interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize it was project by project like that. He says, thank you. And that's it's awesome. It's an opt in. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, interesting. And in, and in this case, and in this case, they are keeping, there is, there is a level of ownership. So it's easier to, to make that change, right? Like there is, the, there is not officially ownership, yeah, right? True, it's, it, they have it, no it, deed. It's, yeah, I mean, and really it should. It should report like right. a mortgage yeah. if it's going to give you some Closer of the benefits of a traditional co-op model. I, but co-op, you still have a deed in the co-op. Technically, it is not ownership. It's the goodies of ownership, but it is not ownership. <laughs> it's, uh, any, yeah. This is why it's so hard for us. But thank you so much for, <laughs> for being patient with us, trying to figure this out. Um, I think we will move on to our break. It is 4.32. Our break was scheduled at 4.20. So do you want to take the full 20 minutes? Are we going to be in trouble if we do that? Okay. We'll take 20 minutes. We'll come back at 4.52. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. On break. We are on item number seven, which is an informational review of the Department of Public Lands Report on Adequately Maintaining Salt Lake City's Public Lands. That is a wordy title. Yeah, it is. We have here uh, Kristen Riker and everyone else. Sorry. I will introduce. Everyone's names, but thank you for being here. Thank you. And we do have a uh, presentation. If we could get that pulled up, that would be great. In the meantime, I'll introduce Carmen Bailey. She is our deputy director over operations. So she oversees golf, urban forestry, parks, and the park rangers, and Tyler Murdoch, and he oversees planning and Charles and Natural Lands divisions. So thanks for having us. You can go to the next slide here. Um, Hopefully you all got a chance to review our, our document. I know it was a lengthy one, um, but it was a big question. And um, we tried our best to um, think of as, as many ways possible to adequately maintain our, our parks. Um, and so um, in this presentation, I just briefly want to give an overview. Um, we're going to provide information about what it takes to adequately maintain our parks. Um, Funding and staffing deficiencies is certainly a, a portion of that. Our aging infrastructure is a portion. Um, grow, the growth of the city, the population growth, extreme weather events, and most impactful really is the camping and the crime and victimization of our park staff, which is pushing away our workforce. Um, the seven points listed here are the way we broke down our challenges and offered solutions. The next seven slides will briefly exp explain each of these areas and are presented in areas of most impact 
um, and our ability to maintain those public spaces. I'll go into more detail of the first two points just since those are kind of most impactful to us and then just share highlights of the other five points. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we will show you a table outlining the costs and FTEs for the strategies, but please feel free to interrupt us at any time. We can stop and talk about whatever one you'd like. Um, we're currently working to employ um, many of these strategies, as many as we can, and so throughout the presentation you'll see slides that are redlined and um, that just shows where we are currently working on something or we've accomplished it. This was given to us a year and a half ago and so as we've worked on it, some of the things we've actually accomplished, which is great. Okay, so next slide please. Um, the first area evolving our workforce force is uh, the most key element inadequately maintaining our parks. This section begins on page four of the document. First and foremost, the daily realities of camping in our parks and the safety concerns in relation to drug use and criminal activity is really shrinking our workforce. Uh, when staff come to work at 6 a.m. to check the functioning of the irrigation system or to mow the lawn or to clean the restrooms, they're waking people up um, who are actually living in the park and that's very unwelcome to um, those folks that are living in the park and it often comes down to yelling at our park staff, threatening our park staff and at times um, we, our park staff have been assaulted um, in the parks and um, we've lost quite a few staff because of their fear for their personal safety. Um, Without the assistance of law enforcement to uphold our parks curfew, staff are instructed to avoid areas of parks that feel unsafe um, and as a result some portions of parks, some parks um, are not adequately maintained in the way other areas might be because our staff is avoiding that area because they feel uncomfortable. We're asked to be told that if that happens and then we can work with the police department to help us in those instances. But that's what happens. Um, our response to your question, how much will it cost to adequately maintain parks, includes a recommendation for adding law enforcement of park curfew hours through off-duty police officers or the reinstatement of the park squad in the police department. <clears throat> the cost of off-duty police officers is in the final table um, at the end of this presentation. It's not in your um, document you received and that's because we were working with the police department at that time to develop that cost. So it's in this presentation and I'm happy to share this updated uh, table with you. Um, Public Lands is currently using our year-end funding to, or our year-end salary savings to fund off-duty police officers to enforce the curfew right now, um, but that funding will end by June 30th and then we will not have um, additional um, enforcement of the curfew unless um, something is funded. Um, the second point here is it is becoming increasingly more difficult uh, to hire employees and even more so seasonal employees. And, and this is kind of an interesting thing that I, maybe you are aware of or not, but under the Affordable Care Act of 2010, be prior to 2010, the parks model was, you know, you have all of these seasonal employees and they work 40 hours a week for nine months and then they're off. After 2010, um, we can't hire employees for more than 29 hours in a week without providing them with health insurance. So we looked into health insurance. Can we give them health insurance and work them more than that? And we found out that if we give them health insurance and we work them more than the 29 hours a week, we also have to pay them pension benefits. And those pension benefits and the health insurance are pretty costly, they're way outside our um, ability to pay them and at some point it becomes less efficient to hire somebody um, and pro provide all those benefits and not just keep them year round because of the training costs over and over of retraining people. Um, so um, <clears throat> because of this six month um, limitation with the Affordable Care Act, um, all of, our, all of our teams have to hire twice in a year. So we go through this hiring challenge twice. Once in, well, our, our season goes from March to October and so after six months 
then we have to let those folks go, and then we have to do another hiring um, um, season. And so that becomes really challenging for our staff when they have a hard time anyway finding seasonal staff. Um, so we did look at the costs of hiring um, full-time parks maintenance technicians to um, full-time, and you can find those costs on page 8. I'm not going to go through that. Um, other solutions for evolving our workforce are adding an afternoon parks cleanup crew, and this would be a crew to manage garbage, restroom cleaning, and troubleshooting at parks during peak times, during afternoons and weekends. That would help make the park look, parks look much nicer. That's outlined on page 7. Adding staff to our very small Trails and Natural Lands team. They're tasked with managing over 2,000 acres of land and 144 miles of paved and unpaved trails. That's outlined on page 9. And adding a parks um, project inspector to oversee construction projects. That's on page 6. And that would help our, our operations managers not be stuck looking at project plans and actually be doing operations management and supervising their staff. Next page. I swear they'll get shorter as we go. <laughs> These first two are just kind of large um, topics. So the next slide is matching our, um, our population growth and growth of the park system. And this starts on page 10 of the document. Reimagine Nature Plan of 2022 calls for adding 94 acres of new park space by 2040 to maintain the same service level as when they assessed our system in 2017. This, um, so 94 acres would significantly disperse the visitor um, use in public spaces throughout more um, acreage of land. Um, since 2015, we added 8.5 acres, and that includes um, Imperial Park, um, it includes Allen Park, and Three Creeks. And then with the GO bond, we'll be able to add another 20 acres um, to that. So that leaves us with about 65 more acres we'll be looking for by 2040. To manage Salt Lake City's population growth in terms of green space, um, we're proposing the following solutions. Page 13 and 14 outline our need for and a plan to expand the public lands planning team from two planners to five. And these additional planners could have a significant impact on um, our projects and um, the backlog that we currently have, which is over 100 open projects. Um, on page 11, you'll see that public lands is also in need of an acquisition plan, and that will help us direct capital investment when we're acquiring properties. And then a strategic plan, um, which we actually were able to fund with some savings that we had this year, and um, we're just beginning work on the capital strategic plan. Next slide, please. As part of managing our urban, urban public land system, we make choices every day for our resource allocation. And there's a balance between the capital funding to replace the infrastructure and operational funding um, to further the life of an asset. And sometimes deciding where those funds go is, can be difficult. And there isn't a single prescriptive way how we should do that. However, through our capital asset planning, we're hoping to develop a guide to use impact fees funding requests to the mayor and to council, and um, to help us in the direction of how we use our existing resources. So that should help us um, in, in prioritizing how our funding will go. So this section on addressing the city's aging infrastructure um, uh, goes into key areas where the city is behind in asset planning for the park system. Pages 17 through 20 outlines the department's needs for new irrigation systems and technologies that will help the department more efficiently use water. And it also propose, proposes a large equipment plan to keep our park staff wholly operational. Um, right now, we don't have a plan or we don't have funding for large equipment replacement. And our large mow area mowers can cost over $200,000 to replace. Um, and we have done that in years past through some savings that we've had when we haven't been able to hire our seasonal staff. Next slide, please. 
Uh, one way to significantly improve public land stewardship capacity and reduce the maintenance burden on field staff is to encourage the local community to take ownership of a park through partnerships, stewardship, and programming. And I'm happy to say that we, had, we do have quite a few partnerships and um, we have a very robust volunteer program right now. Pages 21 through 23 outline ideas to enhance community partnerships. And I'll just highlight those. Um, development of general plans, formerly known as master plans, for all of our neighborhood, community, and regional parks would help expedite some of the process for working with groups to have them come in and do volunteer work or do fundraising for our parks. Um, expanding the department's outreach team and budget to work with more community groups to um, make more of this volunteer um, activity happen and my favorite is um, a the community park activation grants and we saw this in Cincinnati and and that is empowering community members to activate their closest and favorite parks by giving them a small grant to run say um, a dinner or a potluck or whatever they want to run in their parks and that would help activate our parks next slide please Resolving structural imbalances. Um, this is really acquired responsibilities and properties to the department with, that come to us without funding. And at this time, we only have a handful of those issues that take away from our core duties to adequately maintaining our public spaces. I'm not going to go into this one. Um, that's outlined on page 23. On page 24 is the start of our urban forestry resilience goal. Um, our greatest challenge, I think, as everyone knows, is getting our trees watered. Um, and the growth of our forest and trees creates more work orders for and backlogs for our arborists. So some of our requests for solutions have already been resolved, as you can see. Um, however, page 25 outlines the cost and needs for an additional arborist crew. And page 26 describes uncaptured tree work needed at the golf courses, as well as a storm damage response and recovery plan and plans for the development of urban forestry operations yard and a reutilization operation. Next slide. And this is the last point. Um, reducing or eliminating crime and antisocial behaviors in public spaces would greatly improve park safety, appearances, and increase healthy park uses. Um, this strategy is outlined on page 27. So some of those strategies include involving the community in the redesign of can we move to the next slide? parks. Sorry. I, I think we're on the wrong slide. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Kristen. Um, so involving the community in the redesign of existing parks creates um, more relevance for the park in the in the community, which can significantly activate our parks. And thankfully, we're doing that through the geo bond. Um, it's become a huge focus of our planning and community outreach team. When those parks are reimagined, we also take into consideration sight lines and hiding places and try to make sure that we don't have those in our parks to improve our maintenance. Uh, selecting amenities that draw in the community and activate the park is essential to um, having more activity and less criminal activity, more positive activity and less criminal activity. And lastly, an additional animal services crew is, um, is proposed here um, that could patrol our public spaces and would provide greater compliance for dog ownership to follow leash laws in Salt Lake City parks. So next slide. This last slide um, is just a summary of our cost estimates to implement all the strategies available um, to improve the maintenance of our public lands. The department will continue to put forward these initiatives and projects through the budget process with our highest priority needs placed first so that we may achieve greater level of care for the lands under our stewardship. So with that, we're all here to answer questions. Okay, Councilmember Fowler has a question and then we'll go to Councilmember Dugan. Perfect. Thank you, sorry. Um, I don't know, Kristen, if this is in the packet, but is there um, a cost estimate of what it would take both, it, like including, sorry, my brain's working, I promise, at some point, um, including uh, the pension and health insurance benefits and all of that, if we converted, I know I saw it on your solutions, 
but converted the seasonal people and positions to full time? Yes. And that, I believe, is on page, page eight, nine? Page nine. Page nine. And can you just, because I, I mean, can't look right at this moment, what would that, what's that number? Sorry, it's page eight. Um, and, uh, well, what we did is we did it in three phases. So um, we said um, in, in each year we would convert seven seasonals to full time. And <clears throat> so each year that cost, let's see, the full time cost for um, new employees is $595,000. And then we would, dec we would use our seasonal staff dollars to um, credit that. Um, and then there's ongoing costs. So, um, and then there's also one-time funding. So the total ongoing cost would be 455975 for the first year. And, and every year, we didn't include um, inflationary costs in that. Um, but we would ask for additional vehicles um, for those full-time people. So each phase would be a, a yearly cost of half a million dollars. So by the time we're at like phase three of fully transitioning seasonals to, I mean, let's pretend that there's no inflation or anything like that. And just like for numbers sake, right. by the time we're at phase three, it would be like a million and a half a yeah. year. Yeah, we have projected um, 1.3 million for 21 employees to be converted. And is that, how many seasonals do we have now? We have about anywhere from, sorry, uh, 100 to 130 seasonals. It has been very difficult to hire seasonals. Um, so. This is only a small fraction of our seasonal employees that we're talking about. Our staff are very opposed to um, making everybody full time. A, it's pretty, very expensive, but um, they need more people in the summer and they can get some people in the summer. It's just we can't fill all these positions. Bless you. Councilman Fowler. <laughs> Councilman Fowler, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, Councilman Dugan, and did I see Pui? Mm -hmm. Thanks. I appreciate and I appreciate the depth that you went in through the whole report. Uh, it was f nice to read th throughout the whole thing, and I, I was captured on the the updates to the irrigation systems across all the different uh, parks and the you know of course the bird refuges that need some irrigation updates. And you, you had 14 million or 13 million allocated there. Was there a uh, and I wasn't quite sure where that is in in the, this cycle, this budget cycle. And if you were a allocating it for multiple years, just like you did for the uh, FTEs, because I didn't, maybe I missed that when I read the report. Yeah, let's see. Um, so, yeah, we, did, we, we didn't do that same in depth. Um, we would have to go in and, and do a thorough assessment of these irrigation systems, and that would be, so Tyler, I didn't know if you want to jump in on this. Yeah, I, I can just, in the plan, it, it identifies essentially $2 million annually is what it would take. Um, and that's looking at assets, uh, what we would need to replace probably over 10 years. So a rolling $2 million annually to get everything up to speed. Typically, I mean, right now we're not requesting that in a specific budget item. We deal with that right now in our capital improvement request. And so you, you will see those come through on many of our projects, updated irrigation systems, but not, it's, not, it's done on a park by park basis, not a lump sum, like million dollar allocation for irrigation. And on page 17, there are some costs for um, several right. of our most. Right. The, the question I was more like, so this upcoming year, we know there's $13 million and we know there's a, a lot of them that say we need to replace them now, that, which that's on page 17. Yeah. Now, uh, are, any, are those in the, C, were, they, are, were they in the C, uh, mayor's recommended CIP list or? Irrigation. How are, we gonna, how are we chipping away at that? Yeah, projects? like I said, we we chip away at that through individual park CIP projects, and I would have to look through the scope of each of those. I don't know if we've requested any this year. We currently have two ongoing. Um, 
one at Hidden Hollow, one of our preserves that is getting ready to go out to bid. We also requested updates to irrigation systems for our Memorial Tree Grove project that was funded this year. Uh, those are the two that come to mind. Councilmember Pui. It's a tough one to ask for is um, people can't see the irrigation system. And um, I think what we asked for, well, I would have to look. But we have talked about like an irrigation replacement plan to come up with a plan for what that would look like and which ones are in need first f through the end and, um, and what those estimated costs would be. Um, it's pretty costly. It does need to go through the capital program. It can't be used. Maintenance money can't replace a system. Right. Yeah, I just look at the safety side of the house and also some of these places that were would be are impacted because their irrigation systems don't work very well. Yep. All right. Thank you. Question. I do appreciate the, the uh, you know your team and yourself uh, looking into this since we have quite a bit of discussions last year. We we almost made it up in the middle of the budget to try to give you you know full time employees, and I'm glad that you put a lot of thought into this. Um, and try to find uh, a better way of uh, maintaining our, our public spaces, right? The people are, I, I mean, I hear a lot about my parks, the parks in the district too. Um, and um, many people are so thankful to have them, but you know, there is a but, but there is this happening right now. Um, and I know that we can do a little better as a community and as a city also. Um, I do have one quick question. Um, uh, I do appreciate the, the movement or, or the propose of moving some of the seasonal employees to you know part uh, full time and try to leverage some of that. You did mention animal uh, services crew, um, and I'm a little confused about that. that Would that be like a, its own individual uh, group of people, couple people? Yeah, I'll let Carmen take that. Um, so it would be we. Whatever I didn't look at the cost, but it would be for two people, two um, officers dedicated just to our parks and public lands. Right now, we have the contract with the city, and they they respond, but they have they have different priorities. They respond to, um, as you've heard, dogs in need or people being attacked by animals. They have all these different responses. So if we had a dedicated um, team with a truck that could can deal with those issues, it would just be for our parks. Yeah. And my question relates to the park rangers, because I'm still a little confused about the job descriptions um, and the metrics that the park rangers are following. Uh, you put them on, on the slide that says reduce or eliminate crime and antisocial behavior in public spaces, which is fantastic. We all agree with that. Uh, you know, and I think something that we have talked, n not in private, in public, you know, in these meetings, about what metrics, what, you know, how, how uh, are the park rangers reducing and limiting crime, antisocial behaviors, how many of those cases, you know, what are they doing, you know, specifically. And one of the, uh, when this program was introduced last year, it was mentioned also to, to help curve the issue of dogs off leash and, you know, bad uh, dog owners. So then a year ago, it was sort of part of the general idea of park rangers. Um, and now it seems like to be separating itself from the park rangers' overall goal. Right. It, um, so um, the park rangers would work in with the animal control because the park rangers can only ask people to put their their dogs on leash and remind them of the rule and offer them a leash, and they do that quite frequently. And Carmen probably have, has some statistics. I have the stats statistics. right here. So from January, February, and March, they had. <laughs> Um, we call them compliance conversations about dogs off leash. They had 366 of those conversations. When we had the elk issue um, at Parley's Nature Reserve, they went in there and they did a lot of um, public camp campaigning, please put your dog on a leash. And then when it got to kind of a core set of people that were not wanting to uh, do that, then we called in animal services to help us out. Because it, was a, it right? was a safety issue with the elk and the dogs off leash. That makes sense. And you, you call the county, but what you because the county is who who. We we who ask them to, to the county. yes we do. So, but you are asking for animal services crew, which it wouldn't be. Uh, they won't. They it will be the county. So it will be for paying the county to have an extra team, people. two more people here in Salt Lake City 
Okay, now I understand what you mean. That, that was a long, okay. So you're asking us to fund two more people uh, for a service the county provides. This um, is not, these are not FTEs on our, <coughs> uh, no. in, within our city. It's an interlocal agreement to the county. This would be contracted services with the county. Yeah, and just to, to clarify that a little bit more, that's dedicated to our public lands and parks. And right now, if our park rangers at Parley's are trying to enforce that, they would call the county, but the county's going to respond to the most urgent issue right. uh, at the time. And so that could be someone's dog trapped in a car. They're responding to the entire city, not just our public spaces. That makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of dogs in the streets in my neighborhood, so I, I do appreciate that. So thank you. And I thank you for the, uh, indulging me with this the question. And as far as the park rangers go, if you guys have uh, information, uh, you know, when this is coming through the budget, that will be very useful. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. Appreciate that. Any last questions, council members? All right. Let's move on to the next item, which is number eight, police department crime reduction strategies. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I have oh. one quick question. For, for public lands? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Kristen, I apologize, but one of the things that I was curious about are, um, and I talked with HR a little bit about this earlier, this a, a couple months ago maybe, but um, maybe some of the, the barriers to getting people to apply for some of the seasonal positions, like for example, um, having a high school diploma. I, I don't know like if that is always necessary Right for some of those positions, and I'm wondering if we're looking at, at you know, are there barriers that we're kind of arbitrarily and accidentally creating that maybe we can eliminate and open up the pool to people who would want to apply but maybe feel intimidated because they didn't finish high school or something along those lines. Right. That's not one of our requirements for um, being a ground maintenance tech. And I will tell you that I watched our um, office manager just the other day sit with four people who don't speak a lick of English and walk them through the application process. Um, and it must have taken her two hours for these four people. And we ended up hiring those four people, which is so awesome, and we got them placed. Um, but they came in and they were just looking for a position. And, um, and I feel like we try, we bend over backwards um, to try to help people, whether they speak English or not. And these folks happen to speak Spanish, and our office manager speaks Spanish as well. But um, we have um, hired people that um, we had to get an interpreter for um, because nobody in the office spoke their language, and we did that. And um, so we are really looking at, at ways we can limit those barriers and how we can attract more folks. And I just I want to say thanks to council because um, last year in the budget season uh, we asked for a raise for our seasonals from thirteen dollars and fifteen cents an hour with, at the minimum to seventeen, and I think that's helped with returning people um, and also with recruitment. So that was really great as well. That's awesome and so awesome to hear. I really, like, I, I love, I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the question. All right, thank you. We'll move on to number eight, informational briefing on police department crime reduction strategies. Who is introducing this item? Police department? Thank you for having us. Uh, the chief and the mayor unfortunately had some unexpected conflicts come up, so I'm here to, uh, to cover for them. Uh, my name is Deputy Chief Morcus with the police department. Uh, we are here today to provide an update on the violent, cr uh, violent crime reduction strategy that we have put into place um, since last September. Um, we have continued to see reductions in violent crime across the city in large part uh, to the hard work of our officers as well as the strategic actions that we're taking with our partners here who I will introduce uh, with the University of Texas San Antonio. Um, they're going to provide an overview of what the plan, uh, what our strategic plan is for violent crime reduction as well as uh, give an update on 
where we're at and what the next step is. Uh, so with that, uh, we have Dr. Mike Smith and Dr. Rob Tillier. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate that. Uh, good after, good evening, I guess, to everyone. Um, thank you for having us and, and giving us the opportunity to appear before you and uh, provide you some updates on on the Salt Lake City violent crime plan and what the police department's been doing and what the results have been uh, over about the last six months. So I'm Mike Smith. This is my colleague, Rob Tillier. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, probably been a while since you maybe have thought about this um, or heard about it. So just by way of, um, of review, uh, we became engaged with your city um, back last summer and <clears throat> developed um, a strategic plan to reduce uh, violent crime, violent street crime. Uh, and we define that uh, to, to include three primary offense types. Uh, so murder, robbery, and, uh, and non-family violence related aggravated assault. So <clears throat> we, um, we began working with, with Salt Lake City and the Salt Lake City Police Department to develop the strategic plan um, and then put it into effect beginning in September of 2022, so last fall. Um, the plan itself um, is a three-part strategy, uh, a near-term, mid-term, and a longer-term strategy. Uh, the near-term strategy is a sort of a modern 21st century hotspots policing strategy. I should say that all of these strategies are evidence-based, so um, grounded in a lot of literature, um, which is why they're part of our, our crime plan. Um, so the near-term strategy is a hotspots policing strategy. Mid-term strategy is a, a deeper dive into the sort of the underlying problems um, that give rise to violence at persistently violent places. We call that problem-oriented place-based policing. And then the longer term strategy is a focused deterrent strategy that um, that addresses um, prolific violent offenders. And um, and so we are uh, we're about six months into the near term strategy, about to begin the, the mid term strategy. And then we are we haven't gotten to focused deterrence yet. So next slide, please. So the hotspots policing strategy began, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, in September. Uh, the focus is on violence-prone addresses. So we analyze your crime data on a regular basis now. But we did leading up to the implementation of the, of the hotspot strategy in September uh, to identify uh, locations in your city that um, where these three offenses occur the most, the most often. And <clears throat> those, those become the, the treated, the treatment areas. Uh, for the tr for the upcoming treatment period, which is somewhere between 60 to 90 days, we redo this analysis every 60 to 90 days. Most of the hotspots drop off, um, and then um, and then are replaced by by ones that were the most prolific in the previous 60 days. Um, so we have some about seven that we've treated more than once, uh, but most of the hotspots that we've treated have only been treated one time. Um, so that's the um, that's essentially the strategy. That while the officers are there, they are um, they are instructed to be highly visible, which means they sit stationary in their patrol cars with all the lights, all the emergency equipment turned on uh, for for 15 minute intervals during peak crime hours and peak crime days of the week. We also do that analysis to identify when those sort of peak crime times are. Um, that 15 minute period is meaningful. That's also research based. So um, they'll sit there for 15 minutes. They get actually get dispatched there as a call. Um, and then they'll go back in service and go about their business. Um, so <clears throat> so that's kind of how the strategy runs. Um, the goal is to increase guardianship at, at these crime prone, pr prone locations and to deter and to deter violence. Next slide, please. So uh, you'll see some slides. This is just an outline of what's coming up here. Um, one of the things that we track very carefully is what we call treatment fidelity. So our officers there where we want them to be, where they're scheduled to be, when they're scheduled, when we, when we want them to be there. So we, tr we track that carefully. Well, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and then you'll see some slides that, that we, we've looked at the impact of the strategy on crime citywide um, at the treated areas themselves, at catchment areas. So these are 
essentially 1,000 foot buffer zones around each hotspot. Uh, we look for crime changes there to, to measure or gauge whether there's been any crime displacement. That's a common um, tactic or strategy among people like ourselves that track these kind of things. Um, we look for displacement to see whether or not crime is crime moved just kind of around the corner, for example. We typically don't see that and we haven't seen that systematically at all in Salt Lake City. Uh, but we look for it. Um, so we also will show you some results by crime type, each of those three types I mentioned, as well as within the different patrol divisions in Salt Lake. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, there's a lot going on there, but it's, it's actually pretty simple. If you look at the, at the second column from the left, that's the percent fidelity. So um, you'll see the numbers are in the, above the 90% in the, in the 90s, high 90s in most cases. Um, those um, by period, period one, period two, period three. So what that tells us is that the officers were located where we wanted them to be, where they were scheduled to be in the first period 98% of the time. Um, and that's fantastic. That's, you know, we do this kind of work in a number of cities. Um, anything above 90% is great. Um, Salt Lake City is well above 90%. Um, so that's, that's all good. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a longitudinal uh, graph that shows you um, monthly counts of those violent crime incidents uh, starting back in September of 2021 all the way through March, the end of March of this year. Um, and it, it just plots monthly crime counts. Uh, that red line there, that vertical red line is the beginning of the crime plan. Um, <clears throat> so that section of the line there to the right of the, of the red bar um, is the treatment period. And um, monthly, average monthly violent crime count during the treatment period was about 16% lower than it was in the previous year. Um, so it's headed in the direction that we, we would hope to see. Um, and you'll see some variation. Some of that is seasonal. So crime in, in cities like Salt Lake that have four seasons, crime typically goes up in the summertime um, and it goes down in the, in the winter. So I'll have a slide in a minute that will show you actual period to period, but that's just a just real big picture retrospective. What's crime been doing um, over you know, the last year and a half? And, and the, the good news is that it's been going down um, by about 16%. Next slide, please. So this is that period uh, to period to period uh, slide that I mentioned. So this, what you're looking at here is crime during the treatment period. That's the September of 2022 to March of 2023 timeframe compared to the same period a year before. So it kind of takes out that, those seasonal effects and compares period to period. Um, and we show that in a number of different ways. Starting at the left-hand side of the screen, um, that shows you what crime has done citywide. So treatment period compared to a year before, crime's down about 11%. Within the treatment areas itself, so those hot spots where officers are sitting, crime's down about 12%. And in those catchment areas, where again, where we look for displacement, what we typically see is what you see here. Crime typically doesn't go up. What it usually does is it goes down slightly. And that's exactly what we've seen here in Salt Lake City during that six month period, roughly. And then on the right hand side are, 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 are changes by individual crime type. Um, so murder is flat compared to last year. Robbery of individuals is, is uh, static as well. And then the right hand slide shows, the right hand portion of the slide shows you what's happened with business robberies. They're down about a third. Aggravated assaults down about 19%, and gun involved crimes significantly down, um, more than 70% down. Um, so, again, treatment period, the same time last year. All in the green, all in the negative, um, except for the, those two individual crimes, which are, which are flat. Next slide, please. This shows you treatment um, effects by division. Uh, so Pioneer Central Liberty um, in the treatment areas and in the catchment areas. Uh, for the most part, crime is down uh, in both treatment and catchment areas, up somewhat in the catchment areas in, in the central division, uh, but down significantly in the treatment areas. So can you define catchment area? Yeah, that's the thousand foot buffer around each of the of the treated 
hotspots where we look for displacement. So we actually, on a, using mapping software, actually draw a buffer of about 1,000 feet where you typically would, would see displacement if it were going to occur. What's the word catchment used for? That describes the area where crime may migrate to during the treatment period. That's a, that's a term of art that's typically used in, in this kind of work. Okay, I don't so understand it's, the word. It's the geographic space right around where we're treating. Like the immediate thousand foot in any direction is, is, the, is, the, is a catchment area. So if you think about like a bullseye, right, the center is the treatment location, and then the, like the next ring out, a thousand feet, is, is the catchment area. Okay. Next, next slide, please. This gives you an analysis of arrests. So what have arrests been doing uh, during the treatment period um, compared to um, the same time last year? The green bars are your citywide figures and the blue bars are within just the treatment locations themselves. So for the most part, citywide crime is up a little bit um, and uh, citywide about, by about 20%. Um, violent crime arrests are up slightly and and so forth the blue bars are, are the treatment locations and you can see there where crime or arrests are up significantly in the treatment areas um, so again just to just and I give you a, a sense for what police activity is what's happening there um, by arrest type violent arrests disorder related arrests warrant arrests are up significantly um, more than 250 percent in your treatment areas um, drug arrests and weapons arrests. Councilmember Dugan. Thank you. I just want to just highlight the your note. It says the percentages are based on a very low arrest count. Yes. And, and when we have those high, uh, low counts with a high percentage, do we have the, the actual the harder numbers? Did it go from two to three, or did it go from how? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and thank you for pointing that out. I should have mentioned it. In some of these slides where you're dealing with low counts, um, yeah, if you go from you know, one to four, you've got, a, you've got a large percentage change. The actual count is not that large. Uh, we, you know, we can, we can, if you're interested in, in the figures right this second, we can probably pull them up. But. Not, not right this second, but that's overall, because I always want to make sure that when, when my residents read some things, when something goes up really high or goes down really high, it's like, well, sometimes the count is the yes. issue not yeah and that's exactly right in this case that's why we put that little red flag there on, yeah. the, on the on the chart but thank you for pointing it yes. out yeah if we could get the the hard count on some of those bigger issues thank you sure i, I can give you one example if you want just just yeah just like the 250 so, yeah yeah so uh let's look at um so weapons arrests on the far right hand side um the 150 percent increase in the treatment areas so that went from an average of two per month to an average of five per month and that gives you that substantial percentage increase. And that's why we labeled it because of yeah. the inconsistency you get when, with small num numbers. Yeah, and that's where sometimes it's just nice, even with its percentages, here's, yep. here's the hard numbers. So Mr. Chair? Yeah, we've, we've, we've experimented a number of ways over time about showing that. And they get, the slides get pretty busy, but yeah. But thank you for, for pointing Councilor that Pui. out. Um, just a quick question. I, I see that, and I haven't gone through all your presentation just yet, uh, but I saw uh, so far that you're comparing last year uh, to this year. This particular uh, and, slide. Excuse me? This particular slide, that's right. Okay, and the previous one, or the ones, mm -hmm. the couple ones previous also were comparing a year's worth uh, of data. Now, um, one could say that the last couple of years were not normal. Um, so, you know, and using them as baselines, to be also fair, the crime was kind of crazy during the pandemic and whatnot. I mean, many of the, the issues on crimes, at least, uh, you know, violence in the home and things like that were skyrocketed in, across the nation for obvious reasons now we know. But uh, has your study gone a little past a year um, and gone through like what we call the normal times two or three years ago? So the first slide shows you, which gives you the retrospective starting back in 2021. Um, the year and a half, basically, up and up until the end of the treat this cur most current treatment period. Um, when we when we first began to work with you all and began to look at your crime data um, over time, we actually went back 
three years from from when when we would have done that analysis. So we would have gone back to about 2018. Um, I, I don't have that slide here okay. today, um, but we looked at your one of the reasons that we I think we got engaged with you all is that you had a a pretty linear trend of increasing crime going back to 2018. So that's pre pandemic. Um, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't a super steep, as I recall, it wasn't a super steep increase, um, but it was a 13 or 14% increase, I think, over that three year period before the crime plan began. Okay. Uh, and, and I ask these questions because, you know, many, many neighbors will tell me everything is on flames, right? And I, I get it, right? Like I live a couple of blocks from North Temple. So, you know, from one of the, this hot, one of the hot spots mm -hmm. you know, that we are talking about here. And there is also the, the perception of crime, uh, you know, that is, it, it, you know, is out there. And I don't know how we measure that, but I believe that social media and all of these things do play, a, 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 you know, a role in, in how we perceive crime. Um, and the visibility of the crime related to, you know, uh, you know, again, to that, the, the social media and how we, we see it. But uh, I, it is encouraging to see that some of these um, uh, some of these things you're doing, and I see it all the time, and I talk to the chief about the lights on the, on the police cars, and, you know, uh, they seem to be having an effect. Um, um, but I, I would like to see a little past this last year, a little more in this in these examples, uh, to see if there is... Um, more we are on the same side of, of the issue we want to solve this everybody agrees that crime shouldn't be a thing that we want to allow in the city and we don't allow it in the city we just we're just trying to curve it and so a little more data will be helpful but this is encouraging thank you for answering sure. the questions uh, we weren't provided a copy of the slide deck can you tell me how many more slides are in your presentation uh, uh, three or four probably okay great next slide please so this is just a, a graph showing calls for service, the same, same sort of color scheme that we saw before. Green is citywide, uh, blue is treatment areas. Um, Left-hand bars are total calls for service, right-hand bars are violence related. So focusing on those, given that this is a violent crime reduction plan, 13% uh, down citywide, 35% down in the treated areas, uh, which is, again, encouraging what we would hope to see with a, with a treatment of this type. Uh, during the treatment period itself compared to, the, compared to, again, last year. Next slide. So that's just a summary slide, 16% reduction citywide. Um, we, we, you know, in, in the interest of time, I'll skip through that slide. We've gone through all those figures up to now anyway. Next slide, please. Thank you. This kind of tells you where we're going next. The midterm strategy is, is our problem-oriented place-based policing strategy. We've been in town, we were in town last week, uh, did some training for your department heads on what this strategy is about. Um, it is a strategy that's also place-based, again, designed to address the underlying conditions that the proximate causes, if you will, of recurring problems at crime-prone locations. Um, it is a, sort of a, a multidisciplinary approach, um, hence why the other department heads were involved. Um, they uh, named a member of their organization to serve on a working group um, that we were, we were here yesterday training that working group. That group will begin to meet, um, bring in all of the information and data that each of the organizations have on a particular, uh, on particular hot spots, um, and then uh, see if they can begin to diagnose uh, to get at what are those underlying problems, and then hopefully come up with creative solutions to address them. Those solutions are often not police driven um, because the problems, a lot of the problems, the proximate causes of these problems are not necessarily something that's within the control of the police. Hence why the multidisciplinary approach. So that strategy is sort of just getting underway now. We did, did the training, we were in town to do the training last week and this week. Um, and then that, that group will, that inter, interdisciplinary group will begin to meet um, from here on. Next slide, please. So that'll give you a sense of the timeline uh, for that midterm strategy. Um, the group will meet roughly this month and next, um, hopefully um, through the process that, um, that is built, sort of built, built into the strategy, begin to identify what those problems are, generate solutions. Uh, each site is different, that's important. Um, 
the, the plans are tailor-made because every problem uh, or every, every site is different and it requires um, a different uh, set of solutions. And so the, plan, the, 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 the group or the working group will develop these site-specific plans. Um, they'll bring those plans back to the agency heads, um, what we call the advisory board, uh, to review those plans, weigh in, provide suggestions um, or adjustments as needed, and then hopefully approve the final product. And that those strategies uh, will begin to be implemented in, in, the, in the initial location uh, itself. And then our, our work uh, will, as the evaluators of that, uh, of that portion of the strategy will continue um, in the months that follow. Next slide, please. And, and that's this. So, um, as the, new, as the midterm strategy gets underway, hotspots policing doesn't stop. It continues. Um, this is a layered plan. It's designed to be that way. So hotspots policing will continue. Our evaluation of period to period change will continue. And then we'll just layer on um, the, the evaluation of the, of the, of the place-based strategy itself over the, next, um, <clears throat> over the next 6 to 12 to 24 months. And that's, that's the end of the slide deck. All right, thank you. Council members? I have, Mr. Chair, I have a few okay. questions. Go ahead, well, Councilman Baldwin Ross. So um, as you review the, the, the statistics and look at all the calls and all the aggregate, which is um, pretty impressive, I was wondering if you guys also um, are looking into the amount of staff or basically the amount of officers that are responding to each of the calls and if whether the, the amount is sufficient because because it's showing like good results and what's that amount um, and or um, maybe it's overkill and we can use those same officers to go respond to other type of crimes that that or other type of issues that might need help because I think sometimes it, it, it looks really good but sometimes we do see um, I see in the streets a lot of police officers, and, I, and I'm, I don't know what's happening, so I can make pass a judgment of what's happening. But, but I hear from people, and I see it myself, why do you have this many police officers? And for us as a budget perspective, I'm thinking, okay, was that enough? Uh, is that overkill? And can we use these resources in also going to you know, tackle another problem that we might be having in, this, in the city in terms of crime? So that's the one question. And then the second question is, Maybe I misunderstood your last um, slide about other ways of policing. And um, if you're looking at other ways of people-based policing, is that what you call it? I'm sorry, I, uh, the slide is it's out of the... The midterm strategy is actually a place-based strategy, place so based. it's not person-based, but okay. it's based on, again, your persistently violent places. Okay. And trying to really un understand what's causing that, why, why they continue okay. to be violent places and generate calls for service over and over again, um, and then try to address those underlying conditions okay. um, rather than simply being there with your lights on to deter crime. Okay. Sorry, I, I was just thinking about other alternative response models that we have implemented <laughs> in the city to kind of lower the workload of our police department. So okay. um, anyway, but going back to my question about the amount of staff, are we, do we have sufficient? Is it overkill? Do we need more? Can we use our officers <laughs> as resources for uh, taking care of other types of crimes? Thank you. Yeah, so a couple, thank you for the question. A couple of things. Um, it's, our role is not to, um, to do a staffing study um, or to, to weigh in on, on the size of the Salt Lake City Police Department or whether it's too, you know, sufficient or insufficient. I'm sure uh, Deputy Chief Mortkos could, have, uh, could speak to that much more cogently than, than we do um, or could because we're, we're just not involved in that. Um, in terms of the strategy itself, though, I will tell you that this, this, this has been a hotspot strategy report, if you will. That strategy is purposely designed to be a very light footprint strategy. So officers are sitting there with their lights on in their cars for 15 minutes at a time, um, only, only during peak crime hours and, and, and peak crime days of the week. So they're not there all the time. Um, it's purposely designed not to be an over-policing strategy or a, some sort of dragnet approach or, or stop and frisk. It's, it's none of that. Um, it's a very light footprint strategy. That, that there's a lot of evidence shows can have 
can have really good effects. And so I think we're beginning to see some of that emerge here in Salt Lake City. I, I can speak to the, the personnel issue, if you'd like, very quickly. Um, when it comes to a staffing issue, these hotspot patrol dispatch uh, dispatches are typically one officer the vast majority of time. Now, there might be a certain location where somebody wants a backing officer, and, and, and that's fine. They're allowed to do that. But I would say 95 plus percent, if not more, is just one, one officer. So we're not taking significant amount of extra resources from the field. That being said, we are adding a substantial amount of work to our officers to address violent street crime in these locations where it is congregated. Um, so we are actually adding to our officers' workload by engaging in this strategy in with the idea of if we can reduce crime in that area, it actually results in less calls for service, less victimization, so it's really an investment in trying to reduce the manpower or person power needed there in those locations. Um, I think we also have to keep in mind you know, two things. Um, you know, our, our thanks in large part to the leadership um, at our, in our patrol staffing, leadership in our patrol ranks, our response times are still very, very low compared to where they have been historically. The last ones I just saw is under 10 minutes again on the average response time. Um, that has speaks volumes of our officers and how hard they work. And I think we also have to remember, as we're coming into this busy season for us, we talked about seasonality, the summer is the busiest time for us, we're, we're, we're still mandating overtime right now. So when we're talking about resources and how many people we need, um, to make sure that we're still providing the levels of service that people expect and that we need to provide to the community, we are doing mandatory overtime to reach those levels. Uh, and at the same time, we're employing this strategy, again, adding to our officers with the investment of lowering crime in these areas in the long run. Can I just add quickly to that, too, and that the results that we have show that violent calls for service are down 35 percent in the places where officers are at. So to, to, to the deputy chief's point, like we're, you know, there's officers going to those places. And in fact, that is generating less demand for police resources, particularly in the types of calls that we're trying and the types of activities we're trying to interrupt. Mr. Chair, very quickly. Okay, yeah, quickly. We have three more items and closed I, sessions. I will be very quick. I, I see that the treatment seems to be having an effect. I, my, my question is, what is the long term? Because I don't know if this treatment is effective after, I don't know, maybe there is data, but I just doing a quick research, you know, this is not a new strategy. You know, DC has been doing this in, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, some other jurisdictions started doing it a couple of years ago. So will these lights on 15 minutes at a time uh, in this hotspot solve the, the issue in, that, in those hotspots long term? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's solving it right then, which is great, it's a goal, right. but what are the next steps to move this great uh, first step into something long term? Yeah, so great question, and, and no, it won't solve your problems all by itself. Um, that, that's why we have a we have a, a three pronged strategy, and th that midterm strategy that I, I just mentioned that we're about to get underway with is actually designed to hopefully address those the underlying conditions at some of those places, so that hopefully they won't be hot spots anymore. That's the goal, um, and so it is very much a layered plan recognizing that one of these strategies by itself is not going to is not going to you know solve the violent crime problem in Salt Lake or any city by itself it is it is one piece of the of the of the puzzle but it's 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 insufficient by itself to 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 you know to deal with your persistently violent places they've been that way for a long time um, and that and simply putting an officer there will suppress crime and we've seen that uh, and we see that repeatedly in the literature, but it's not going to solve the problem long term. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We're going to move on to item number nine, which is an economic development revolving loan fund for Trackland LLC. Uh, Allison Rowland, looks like Will and Roberta are here to present on this item. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. This is a uh, proposed loan for Trackland LLC. Um, it would be a $350,000 loan at 11% interest over seven years, and it would be used for working capital and hiring. Um, it would create 20 new jobs in the next year and retain eight jobs that are currently existing. So I will turn it over to Roberta and Will. 
Thank you, Allison. Um, just real quickly, it's great to be with you, council members. Um, we're, we're excited to present to you Trackland. I think you'll notice that is not your typical loan that we've brought before you. Um, this is our first tech company that we've seen come through since we've had the program. And, and that's because, you know, it, we've, it, we've struggled to find to have this be a good fit for tech companies. Normally they need different types of financing. So this is one that kind of was this niche um, of application that we found and that we are able to, to get through to the loan committee. So um, I'll pass it over to Will to, uh, to, to present something. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, council members. Uh, we're really um, pleased to um, present this loan request on behalf of Trackland. Um, Allison and Roberta both did a really excellent job of summarizing, so I would be happy to answer any of your questions at this time. Councilmember, do you have any questions on this loan fund? Yeah, I think I sent out a couple of questions to Allison earlier about just the uh, the uh, employees yes. and being the remote workers, but also the projection of the, the vision of the the company find a place a more permanent house instead of permanent location vice in the R1 areas. Could you kind of address that again? Just sure. For um, and we're actually, I'll defer to Will since he'll probably get it correct. Um, I sent you an email about 1015. You probably saw it. Yeah, could you just kind of? Yeah, happy to. Um, and that's a great question. So two of the eight employees are locally based. Um, and as they grow, the growth plan is to um, expand in Sugar House. They have deep roots in Sugar House. Um, they're going to recruit from the University of Utah, Westminster College, and Salt Lake Community College. Um, look to hire young graduates to fill out their marketing and sales positions. Um, and the plan is very much focused on growth within the Sugar House area. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we are, no, thank you so much. Right. Okay. Thank you. I think we're moving on. Um, before we jump to item 10, are the board appointees here? I don't want to make them wait any longer. Um, I see Ross, John, Matt, Madeline, and Annie. Let's go ahead and Let's go ahead and jump to this item so that we don't make you wait any longer. Uh, this one. Great. We are interviewing board appointees for the Sister Cities Board. Looks like we have three people here and we may have one joining us later and we can come back to them at that point. But we are excited that the Sister Cities program is uh, up and running again and becoming more active. We're excited for the delegation from Matsumoto to come later this year um, and excited to have some new members of the board. So why don't we just start with Ross and go down the line. If you'll just introduce yourself, uh, tell us what country, if there's a particular country that, or a city that you will be facilitating the, the partnership with and then what your history is with that, sure. that city. Uh, and sure. Well, uh, uh, my name is Ross Chambliss. I just wanted to thank the council uh, from, uh, just for uh, for the opportunity to interview for this uh, position. Um, my interest is with the relationship with Matsumoto, Japan. Um, it's just, it's a relationship I've, I feel like I've been involved with since I was probably four or five years old. Uh, <clears throat> my father, when he worked for Mayor Ted Wilson's administration, um, uh, started opening up our house to host visitors from Japan. And ever since then, it was it kind of became almost an annual ritual. Uh, so through that, uh, we, we uh, developed a lot of friendships over there. Um, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to live there for four years uh, as an English teacher uh, between 2003 and 2007. Um, I was able to just uh, make a lot of good friendships during that time as well. Um, I was also able to meet the person who eventually I would get married to. <laughs> and so we live here now uh, together. We're raising two um, my wife, Ikue, uh, my partner, um, unfortunately can't be here now. She's actually working. She's at work at the hospital. She's a nurse. Um, but we're raising two daughters together here in Salt Lake, which is our home now. Um, but we still have close ties to our sister city. Um, you know, I basically married into this relationship, so <laughs> pretty committed to it. Um, we're actually planning to go there 
next month. Uh, it's been about five years since COVID uh, to be able to go back and visit friends there. Uh, I'm very excited for the delegation coming later this summer. And um, I think there's a lot of great opportunities with this relationship to advance it further after 65 years of, of friendship for our city. And uh, I think the sister city program generally um, has a lot of, is, is very valuable for our city in lots of different ways. But I'll, I'll, I'll end there, so thank you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, Councilmember, any questions for Ross? Councilman Dugan? Okay. Thank you very much, Ross, for uh, representing the city and the district on this, and, uh, and love your uh, passion for it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chair, in some ways, you guys have become some sort of ambassadors for, for this city. Um, and, you know, last year we, we were talking about uh, follow the invasion of Ukraine, uh, you know, with Chernivsky, our sister city in Ukraine, uh, and we realized about the program being somewhat dead, uh, you know, the sister city program. Um, so it's, it's fantastic to see it come back to life and uh, all of your energy and passion to make our city and its connections keep alive. So thank you. All right. Next. Hello, uh, my name is Annie Kwan, Hi, Annie. and um, you know I don't really have a particular city necessarily that, but um, I rem to be completely honest, I have completely forgotten about the sister city program, and then when this program came up and just the casual conversation, um, it just flooded with all these memories. I, I grew up here in Salt Lake, and I remember uh, doing the Pen Pal program when I was in elementary school wow. with the Sister City. And as an adult, I'd completely forgotten about it. And um, if you can imagine growing up here in the 80s, <clears throat> not to age myself here, but um, it was a very, very uh, white. Um, so to be able to have this penmanship with this sister city in Japan, it was amazing and it just blew my mind and I just had so much fun with it. And so uh, when I was presented with this amazing opportunity, I just felt like I, as a steward of this community, it'd be such a great opportunity to represent Salt Lake and be able to uh, add on to this program. So thanks for having me. Oh, it's incredible the years of history that both of you have with this program. So thank you. Council members, any other questions for Annie? All right. My name is uh, John Wilson. Um, I have kind of a unique background to the Sister City program also. I'm not here to represent a particular city. Um, my grandmother was actually the very first president of the International Sister City program. And uh, so I grew up in the Sister City program. She was appointed by Eisenhower. And, um, and I've just always loved the, uh, the idea behind it. And um, uh, unfortunately, my father's passed away, but I'm, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to continue on in, in her spirit and to be able to, again, exemplify the, uh, the spirit of, of togetherness that I think Sister City talks about. You know, it's, it's people to people. And that's what it's really all about. So, and again, I, I actually live in District 3, so um, I, I live up in the avenues and just, I love the city and um, yeah, so that's Fine. me. Wonderful, Councilmember, any questions for John? Thank you so much and may I guess Madeline? Yeah, I'm Madeline Mortensen. I grew up in Salt Lake County and I went to school at Utah State, so I lived in Logan for a while. And I, this is my first time living in Salt Lake City, and it seemed like very fun to live in the capital, capital city. Um, Councilwoman Valdemoros is my representative. I signed up for her newsletter, and that's where I found out about it. I had been looking for a way to, like, Get more, I was looking for a way to like get more involved and to volunteer, and um, I just have like a deep love of travel, a deep love of people and places, and so the idea of getting to participate in something that would help like my my city connect with people in other places on a city to civil city level was very exciting to me and seemed like a really great way to get involved. Well, thank you so much for your willingness to serve the city, council members. Any questions for Madeline? No, I just wanted to say thank you to Madeline and all of you guys. This is an exciting program. I'm excited that we're uh, reviving it a little bit. I think, um, I think it's one of the funnest things that you can do, I think, for the city. And, and thank you for being our ambassadors, our representatives. Uh, hopefully we can support you as council as you come up with ideas and, you know, and, and the other sister cities and all the things how we can collaborate. I know there's a lot of um, fraternal love, or I'm not sure if that's the the name of, of the thing, but we had our delegation from Peru not too long ago, and we were able to uh, collaborate and help those that were in need in our sister city. So I'm excited to hear from you guys to see what else we can do, and 
become even closer. So thank you. There is something to highlight, though. Someone reads our newsletters. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's and signs up for them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Go just, ahead, Councilman Warden. I just wanted that this is really cool to have like people with like such personal stories yeah. to add. So the, to the three of you, thanks so much. And to you, it's very cool that you just came to Salt Lake and that you're ready to jump in with um, with a board and commission. And um, we're really glad to have you. And um, I hope um, I wish all, every resident did that when they um, came to our city. But um, we're really glad to have your enthusiasm. Thanks to all of you. So as a matter of procedure, you'll be confirmed during our consent agenda. Uh, that happens at the end of the meeting. You don't need to attend our meeting tonight. Um, and no news is good news. Thank you for being willing to serve the city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move backwards. There's an informational briefing that is written about uh, renaming the airport greeting room for Senator Jake Garn. There's another written briefing about our memorandum for the 2023 election services, which is uh, our agreement with the county to provide our services for our uh, ranked choice voting election this year. And then we, our last discussion will be item number 10 on our agenda, which is um, a extension of the, the mayor's local emergency declaration for the state of flooding. And I think it's Katie Lewis that is going to talk us through what our role is in this. And Laura Briefer is on, the director Briefer is online. Hello, council members. Um, we are here today to discuss extending the declaration of local emergency that Mayor Aaron Mendenhall issued on April 12th, 2023, related to um, flooding and warming temperatures related to higher than normal levels of snowpack. Um, as you may recall, because we have been through this process of extending local emergencies before, that the mayor has the authority to, to declare a local emergency and issue related orders. Uh, and that local emergency remains in effect for 30 days. After that, the council has the authority to extend that local emergency for any time that it deems appropriate. Any of the orders that the mayor has issued during that time would remain in effect during that time. Um, my understanding is that there are not any orders currently in effect. There were some related to voluntary evacuation related to the flooding at Wasatch Hollow, but those are not in effect anymore. So right now the declaration of local emergency is really in preparation for any flooding that may occur so that the, the city can issue orders and help citizens if those, if those floods occur. Uh, and I will turn it over to Director Briefer, uh, you will see that the extension in your packet, uh, the date is blank, and she can speak to projected snowpack and flooding uh, and what date might be appropriate if the council decides to extend it. Director Briefer. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so my recommendation based on um, examining the uh, forecast the most recent forecasts that we have from the National Weather Service Colorado Basin River Forecast Center, uh, plus some of the information we've been gathering uh, with field visits into the watersheds, is um, it would be appropriate anytime between June 15th and June 30th. Uh, many of our streams are forecasted to peak at the end or the beginning of June, end of May. Um, little Cottonwood and Big Cottonwood Stream, while not in Salt Lake City, has a little bit of a later peak and potentially um, a larger impact and in particular potential impact to Salt Lake City's water infrastructure, such as the Big Cottonwood water treatment plant, which we are currently uh, trying to harden ahead of those um, expected flows. Um, so that's my recommendation based on the existing data. I think June 15th or June 30, 30th, somewhere around there would be um, just, just fine. Katie, there was a time when we extended local emergencies seemed like every week <laughs> and I felt like we all understood the laws surrounding that very well. But isn't there some guardrails as to 
um, how short or how long that extension can be, or can are we open to extending it for whatever period we want to? You are open to extend it for whatever period you think is appropriate. The initial 30 days is the, the only limitation under Utah law and city code. Okay, so I guess council member, and this is, we need to do this today, right? Th In that's order correct. for it to not expire. Yeah, the, unless you wanted to wait until the 9th because it goes until the 12th, but you don't have a formal meeting on the 9th, which is why we scheduled it today. Right, that makes sense. I would just say, throw it out there at 1 July. The 1st of July. I just, yeah. Or that 30, is outside of Laura's window. Or, or, 30, or, 30, <laughs> June, or, or 30 June, 30 June. <laughs> I'm just gonna go to the end of the June, 30 June, because I think she uh, mentioned the end. I'm fine with that. Council members, anyone disagree? Okay, um, and that sounds like we're, we're happy to extend it till the end of June, beginning of July. So we'll get some language in our motion sheet, I assume. Yes, that sounds okay. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have some, uh, there's no report from the chair, vice chair, but I do think we have some reports, and then we do have a closed session on a couple topics. Uh, just a quick announcement that in keeping with past practice, uh, we will shift the uh, delivery of the council materials, the agenda and um, staff reports and background information to Friday instead of Thursday. That'll give us a little more time during this uh, condensed, um, intense time, budget time. And then um, the last item is um, inland port travel. Council member Petro has been included in an upcoming bit of travel that the port inland port board is um, undertaking. They are going to look at rail sites and other best practices in Germany. Um, the group will also join part of a trade mission that Governor Cox is leading. Um, the inland port is, is willing to cover the costs for all of the board members, but the city um, has a longstanding policy that um, if it's uh, something that will benefit the city taxpayers, it's more appropriate to have it funded by the city uh, than to have an outside organization because it preserves uh, independence and objectivity. So the um, um, city attorney's office had, has advised that uh, that in order to ha avoid having it appear like a gift or something like that, it um, should be paid by the city if um, someone make, uh, travels. So uh, we need to give direction on to whether the council supports that. <laughs> All right. Anyone have questions on on the what we're being asked? Personally, I think. <laughs> We need a representative to be there uh, so that those decisions are made. Uh, there, there's a reason why we have a seat on the board, even though it's not a voting seat, and I think that a lot of decisions may be made on this trip. So uh, personally, I think that it's important that we have a representative there. And, and hopefully they won't actually make decisions, but there will be right. a great deal of discussion. Discussion will be made, and that discussion. <laughs> seeing things firsthand. Um, and if you haven't Things, been in those information will be gathered yeah, and if you have learned and in relationships those conversations. created and I think we need a city representative to be there personally anyone disagree no. I hesitate for the trip but I think you're right about having someone there at least uh, being the eyes on the ground while eyes and ears on the ground during these discussions so we have a, a sense of what they're discussing and looking at. So I agree, sometimes I go, hmm, do we really need to go outside the country to do something that we could probably do inside the country? But I also think we need to be in the position to uh, understand what they're thinking. I, yeah, and I would think if, because to the extent that the Inland Port Authority has already chosen that they are going to have this trip, I feel like we have no choice but to make sure our city it, our city represented. It, are, is represented in those conversations. Mr. Chair, and I think... But whether that trip needed to be in Germany or if there was a port closer by is uh, not a question that was presented to us. No, I think it's essential that 
uh, council member Petro goes because it's not only for her to listen about other ports and things, that, but also for her input, like direct input right then, right there, as she gets to see how other countries do inland ports and, and all the innovation, innovations out there. So I think it's, I'm comfortable with this, that she goes there and is there where the conversations are happening. So thanks. Um, I understand the concern too about the, like, I guess the international travel in terms of cost, but when it comes to like ideas about making the port um, more environmentally sustainable and um, I, I actually think it's probably better to look to European models. Um, so I think that I wish the cost was that wasn't there, but I don't. I don't have a concern about it. But actually, I mean, I have other sure, concerns yeah. about the inland port and some of the things in the contract that's separate from this discussion. Hmm. Sure. Yes, and I, I think that to the extent that I, I think what uh, my feeling is that to the extent that we don't participate in this as a, we don't have a representative in the city, then our goals or our f concerns related to that big issue will not be represented. Right. Okay. Sounds like appreciate that. That's a yes. Thank you. All right, council members, I'm looking for a motion to enter closed session for the purposes of uh, strategy sessions to discuss collective bargaining, strategy sessions to discuss purchase, exchange, or lease of real property, and attorney client matters. So move. Move. I have a motion from Councilmember Pui and a second from Councilmember Wharton. Any discussion? I'll roll call Councilmember Pui. Yes. Fowler? Yes. Wharton? Yes. Valdemoros? Yes. Dugan? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes six to zero with Councilmember Petro absent. Oh, Councilmember Petro, she's, she's absent. Okay. Great. We are moving into closed session. This will conclude our work session and we will reconvene at or around 7 p.m. for our formal session.